Hey guys, this is a new project I'm involved with, so if it sounds interesting to you, give it a shot and let me know how you like it. Ever wish you could get involved in music licensing and start collecting ongoing royalties for placing your tracks in movies, commercials, trailers, and video games? Well, now you can. Simply check out this new free training video called Where the Money's Hiding in the Music Business in 2023. You can find it online at musicreboot.com, and this video shows you how to create the financial stability you've always wanted and how to take advantage of the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing due to the current situation of streaming and the internet. So check it out online right now at musicreboot.com. Whether you've never made a placement before, or even if you've made a few placements, but you don't have a specific system to make ongoing placements more consistently, this video has got you covered. So check it out online right now at musicreboot.com. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I've got an awesome guest from England up near Glastonbury with Kavis Tarabi. And I wanted to say a quick shout out and thank you to uh, two like monster guitar players and cool guys who turned me on to Kavis, Darren Charles from Godsticks and the wonderful Dan Mongrain from Voivod. So let me give you the cliff notes on Kavis. He's a bright guy, extremely smart, great musician, and just a cool guy to talk to. So this is going to be fun. He's a multi-instrumentalist and a member. He was a member of the popular progressive group Cardiacs. Um, Cardiacs got a massive cult following. It's kind of like if you know, you know, kind of a band. Uh, and he's currently the lead guitarist and front man for the current lineup of the legendary psychedelic band Gong, as well as his own projects, including Knife World and the Utopia Strong. He also frequently collaborates with a lot of other artists in the Prague and avant-garde avant genre. I can't, like, I don't know. I Your music is so, I, I don't have a label for it, so I can't describe it to people. But I like it, I I think psychedelic is a nice umbrella, but, um, you yeah, know. I, yeah, I think so, man. I think psychedelic could um, put it this way. If you like different, this is your man, and you got to hone in on him because he's great at it. Um, let's see here. Um, Kavis is also the co-author of this book called Medical Grade Music. It's a, him and Steve Davis. Uh, Steve Davis is actually a well-known British snooker player, DJ and Kavis's bandmate in the Utopia Strong. This is a really cool, r extremely well-written book. And it's kind of like autobi it's both of their autobiographies. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real easy read. It's, re you know, the reading of this book is kind of listen to your music. It's like very, it's like gets you, it's like Zen, man. You just like, you can't listen to your solo album and not just be like, ah, like just, you know, sort of like at one with the music. So, and I found the same when I was reading the book. Um, like I said, in general, if you like unconventional psychedelic rock, Kavis is your man. Go out and listen to everything he's involved with. He also has a solo album out called Hip to the Jag. It's a beautiful record I just talked about. Uh, if, if you want to hear a couple of cool tracks on there, uh, the songs I'd recommend you start out with is You Broke My Fall and Radio to Their World, where I was just telling Kavis before, he actually sounds like Sid Barrett on there. So uh, good stuff. Dude, thank you so much for uh, your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. been looking forward to well, talking. Well, thank you. I mean, I've, I've got to just sort of say just uh, as well um, how incredibly flattering it is really, or how humbling actually it is to, to hear that I was recommended by, you know, Dan Mongrain and Darren Charles. I mean, it's both incredible and you know my my feelings well voivod was very very key band in my life you know they're they're my beatles in a way well yeah maybe xtc is my beatles or kind of, but anyway <laughs> voivod is, um, <laughs> voivod is uh, still to this day a, a very very big um thing for me and uh certainly wa was when when i was 16 you know nice absolutely Right on, man. Well, let's dig into this. So uh, in your book, you talked about how your mom was a nurse from Hull, which is up north, guys, in north in England. And she moved to Iran to meet and met your dad, who was a doctor. And apparently your dad's side of the family viewed becoming a musician. And I quote, <laughs> this is a <laughs> rating somewhere between being a prostitute and a dustman. Okay. So you're actually a bit of an anomaly here in that of the over 900 guests I've had on this show, the actual number one thing they have in common is they had parental support to follow their dreams to become a musician. And obviously we're both parents and we know supporting our kids' passion in anything they're doing is like incredibly important. But for you, this absence of support sort of gave you a fair amount of rebelliousness. I'm probably understating with a fair amount, a fair amount of rebelliousness and like righteous indignation that fueled you. 
So few questions. Did your dad ever come around? And also, what did you learn from that whole experience, both good and bad, to whatever extent you're comfortable sharing? Um, well, my, my, yeah, my dad sort of, my dad has sort of come around. Um, I mean, he used to say back in the nineties, your music is too scientific. Um, so, but I mean, look, it, this guy likes Cliff Richard. He's sort of <laughs> not really interested in music. Um, I think he, honestly, I mean, it's, you know, uh, he, he's interested wants, in he pop music. My, my friends have never heard of you. And he said, well, why would they? You know, why would your they, friends right? have never heard of Fred Frith, you know. Your hands are, <laughs> you, if I think of, you know. So, um, you know, you, your friends have never heard of Terry Riley or something. So why why on earth would they have heard of me? But, um, no, I, I, I mean, he, he came around, I think, because more of, you know, um, he had that he had something to sort of show off about like oh look he's he's written a book now and oh look he's got written about in a in a magazine or something so if i was i was re you know if i was recently in um a guitarist magazine which is very nice you know life goal tick but um then he liked that <laughs> because, oh, look, my son my son is in magazine that's cool you know, as but, hell so he likes that but i don't think he, he doesn't really understand my music but it, it's fine because he's not like he's listening to sort of you know he's he's listening to i don't know Lots of he's not your marketplace. Doesn't like mine. You know, he just doesn't really. He likes. I think he likes music. Um, although he, I just don't think he. He doesn't. It, he doesn't have that connection with it that I do. I think maybe he sees it as something like entertainment y or frivolous or whatever. Was I? Th I think it's the most important thing that there is. You know. So right. Uh, so it's very yeah. hard for him to relate to that. And I, and I think a lot of it's to do with it's like you know just his background. Um, and Iranian culture, you know, they're, they're, they just don't, you know, certainly my side of the family, they don't really have any artists in there or anyone sort of particularly creative. They've all, that, that side of the family all got kind of jobs, you know, proper jobs right. um, and, you know, professions. And so I think that's hard for him to um, to deal with. I think they're all big on ed education and stuff in that side of the family. I mean, I I left school as soon as I could. Uh, because I knew what I wanted to do, and I, yeah. being at school wasn't going to help that, you know. Um, so I, academics, I to... like your doctors, academics in general are very—that's their world, and they yeah. don't understand anything outside of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you've never, if they've never really had that sort of pull uh, or whatever, whatever it is, then you're 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 not ne necessarily going to understand it. I mean, I didn't choose. I don't think uh, that for, for the music to have the effect on me that it did, but sure. it had such a sort of you know r right from being a from being a a child always hearing music in my head, always had a um, piece of music. I still do, you know. I always have music playing in my head, and I just thought this was normal. And then it's you know when you get older and you start saying to people what 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 song are you thinking of or what you got playing in your head, and people say, yeah, well, nothing. And of course, I've met other people, who, and it's just like, well, that's kind of strange, right? I'm right. Sort of always, always. But it wasn't until I was about eight or nine that I realized, I, I sort of, you know, saw that, oh, okay, this is something I can do. I made the connection that, oh, yeah, this, now I can do this as well, sort of thing. Right. So, um, so it's not, yeah, it's not to sort of talk smack about my dad. He's, you know, it's, he's cool. It's just, he doesn't, he doesn't get it. It, it doesn't, doesn't get um, it. And I, I think he was, you know, he was very keen. So especially to feel the pressure um, from his family and his parents and stuff that I, I think it must be very disappointing for him to, to, to have a son that, that he just couldn't relate to what it is I did, what my lifestyle choices, what that I was not really interested in um, money and status. You know, the money was only ever, and still is really only ever there to sort of oil the cogs of consequence, you know, allow sure. you to, to do, to do what it is, you're, you're trying to do you know so sure totally I, I think he it. doesn't really my mum does understand that i think it was yeah uh, she it was seemed, she was her, pretty you know. to whatever at least in the book it really seemed like to whatever extent she could in her situation she she was very encouraging and supportive no know. not at the oh, time no? She is since. <laughs> no she is since but i think at the time but then it was stuck. look it was it was the 80s they separated not long after i left home oh, okay. uh, it, was, it, it was the 80s it was a kind of i don't know i think they had ideas about the kind of family they wanted to be 
and the kids just didn't really turn out as as we know the kid, you know you you can have <laughs> ideas about this and that's a terrible thing to do because you don't want to be projecting that onto your kids you know yeah, uh, yeah because no matter one. what you do they're going to turn out they're going to turn out the way that they're going to turn out anyway we got yeah. all you can do is try and error correct one way or another but even then that's not you know that may not be appreciated yeah what what uh, so what what did you learn from that experience both good and bad um i don't know whether i would have wanted necessarily to have been a rebellious kid i don't know that i was i wasn't a, a necessarily naughty kid i certainly wasn't at school um i've always been very talkative you know but i'm never i was never a naughty kid i've never you know i've always had a i think i've always had a pretty straight mixed by analogies but it's metaphors but a straight moral compass you know so mm -hmm. but then obviously you know you you're a kid growing up in you know going through all the kind of weirdness of puberty or whatever but um you know i i, I but i just wanted to i knew i wanted to do music from a quite an early age and i feel really lucky about that because every every decision i've every decision i've made has been kind of based on that and it's it's all i really think about and it's all i've ever thought about um, and it's the it's the people I've, I kind of feel sorry for who who don't really know what they want or say oh I would have liked to have done this but dot 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 and there was yeah. never that with me there was there was never really a ever a, a, I mean I had one little wobble when I was about twenty one for about three or four days I thought that my life had been a waste of time and maybe I should train to be a doctor but that was having spent a few days with my dad and thinking or oh, maybe I should. But you know, whatever. But no, it all, yeah. all really from hearing, from really, really hearing music and realizing that that was something you could do. Um, that I mean, there was that there, there wasn't anything else. So I like that I didn't have a choice. And it's like um, there's a great quote in the I don't know if you know the film Head, the monkeys, the monkeys, yeah, quote, yeah, the monkeys film Head, which is one of my favorite films. Uh, movies. God, it's so old, yeah. But yeah, but I, I, you know, I went through a period of like watching it, you know, every week or whatever. But there's a quote in that, and I, I, I think about this quote every day, and I apply it to my life. And the quote is that where there is choice, there is misery, and where there is clarity, there is no choice. And this, as a piece of life ah, advice, this is perfect. That's, that's cool, you know? man. And I'm, I'm even the same with recording. I think about that. I don't want to give myself too many stems and decide. Oh well, I'll fix that in the mix. Or I'll decide in the mix. It's like. I still, even though I use digital recording, I'll still do old school, like, like almost like it was on tape, and get the comp I want, and then delete everything else. So I just can't give myself these choices. You know, you've got what to sort that? of go with where, where there's clarity. I think so. That's how it was with music. Where there is I none, just, there is clarity. Where where there is where there is choice, there is misery. Where there is and none, and where there is clarity, there is no choice. Oh, that's awesome! I like that, man. It's good, yeah. I mean, really, really works um, to apply to your life. Um, so, yeah. uh, and that's how it was with Love music. That. There, there really wasn't a choice. Um, uh, so, I was. It was that kind of thing of just well, as long as I'm doing that, that's all. That's all I want to be doing, you know, all the time. Well, p props to you for following that. You know, it's not always easy. But really, there was no, <laughs> there was no choice. <laughs> there was no choice. It was easy. I didn't it was want misery. You know, I didn't, I didn't really want to face the misery of the choice. So, uh, at a certain time, they enrolled you in private school. I don't know what you called it over there, but I'm saying it for America. Yeah, private school, public. But okay. weirdly, we called it. It's called public school, but yeah, private school. Yeah, which yeah. is weird. I was like public. Yeah, school. I know yeah. it doesn't make sense, but it's like yeah. many things. It's, it's this like labor country. and yeah, it doesn't the, make the other one. Yeah. Um, so they enrolled you in private school thinking that would give you a better, better education and that definitely didn't work out and it wasn't for you. And in fact, you said something and I thought it was, this is a pretty good quote. I learned that if you're going to be different, you'll get rocks thrown at you. Learn to love getting rocks thrown at you. That's your yeah. head quote. That's, that's, yeah, that's a great quote. So talk yeah. about what happened there, man. Well, I think it was, it's just that, I mean, I was talking to someone about this recently about about sort of education. It's a strange thing because it was pretty harsh. In, in that point, they were like doing, still doing sort of like, um, uh, you know, caning people, like whipping them with a with a cane. I, and, I couldn't believe that shit when I was. <laughs> honestly, I got I got the gym slipper um, from an extremely sadistic. Uh, he took a run up. It's like a, a like a trainer, a sneaker. 
you know, yeah. and he took a runner, hit my ass with that for um that, for some very even, minor infraction that I will. How does base, that get in uh, your brain even to do something like that? What it makes it just it re obviously you feel really resentful. <laughs> um, I couldn't wait to leave. I just could yeah. not. And it got to the point where I'm, I was just sort of counting down, like just get through more of this shit and then get out. But, um, but which wasn't the, but I mean, the great thing was I found some really cool friends that I'm still friends with now uh, while I was at school. And uh, not everybody was, not everybody was awful, but a lot of the kids were. Um and yeah, they were pretty. Was just, I, I was surprised to read how much ignorance about, like, you know, being half Iranian. Like, I, was I couldn't. Strange, I could. I couldn't believe. Like, I grew up in New York City. Nobody was from this country. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. So it was like it was like every, and I would have thought it would be the same over there to some extent. But do you know, um, uh, I can't speak on behalf of everyone. I, I was, you know, I, I grew up in Plymouth, which in the eighties was kind of pretty white. Um, uh, okay. Not that I'm, not that I'm that not white, but you know, having a foreign name and being whatever. I mean, that was kind yeah. of. Yeah. I think it was more just to have someone to sort of tease or to like. I would, you know, just be picked on or whatever. But I kind of. I kind of got into it. I liked being different. I liked that I was the foreign kid. Yeah. I liked that. Um, and then the more that I sort of, you know, the older I got and the more I sort of started to realize the values of the school and the kind of um, institution and what it sort of represented, the more I kind of just took this sort of, well, whatever you are, that's what I'm not. You know, and they right. they did have a good music department actually, but and a good art department, which was great for me. But um, but generally in the school, it was more sort of more geared towards like maybe the military, that kind of thing. And yeah, that's what I got <laughs> I out imagine. of it. Yeah, that, that was not my um, not a good not fit thing at all. Yeah. Uh, so it, it just yeah, but the thing about learning to get rocks thrown at you it was more that right. I'm going to be, I'll be the freak. You want you you know you think I'll be I'm a freak. I'll, I'll be the freak. I'll be the weirdo. You know, I was, I was kind of into it, you know, and the eighties as well was a, I think, I mean, I'm sure everybody will talk about the, their decade, particularly the formative years between, I don't know, what, what 12, 11 to sort of 19 or whatever. Yeah. I just, I, it was set against such a backdrop of brilliant, brilliant invention. I think um, for me in terms of music, what was happening, um, and um, so much amazing music came out. That I, I, that it took me a while to really get into older stuff uh, beyond, like my year zero was sort of 1980. Yeah. And it wasn't really until the, the mid 80s I could sort of listen to stuff like Led Zeppelin or um, Black Sabbath and, and get into it. It just sounded so old originally, you know, for me at the time. Interesting. Music was so exciting. Um, I mean, it always is, but, you know, the development of mainstream music. Guys, today's episode is brought to you by Lewitt Microphones. And for a limited time, Lewitt is giving Everyone Loves Guitar listeners 20% off any microphone in their catalog, including their top-end mics. Now, I've been testing this cool-looking Lewitt LCT440 Pure for the last few months, and it's outstanding. And if you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash Lewitt, you can see my review of this microphone, as well as some other professional recording artists' reviews of two of Lewitt's most popular microphones, as well as get your 20% discount code. The mics come with a 30-day guarantee and a one-year warranty, so there's absolutely no risk involved here. Just just go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash Lewitt, L-E-W-I-T-T, to get your discount code and to check out some short videos with in-depth information to see what recording and performing with Lewitt mics is like. It was so exciting for me from that period between 1980 and 1988. There seemed to be so much development. I can remember, um, for example, like Human League putting out a song called Being Boiled, which is really brilliant you know it had such a funny atmosphere to it and how sort of futuristic that sounded because it's like the it's the real uh the dawn of like synth pop and yes. then you know a few weeks later or if, if, i don't know whenever it was and maybe i've got my timeline slightly wrong here but then you know a little while later depeche mode putting out their first single new life and that's just suddenly the human league thing from a few months before sounded really old-fashioned and 
the, the, you know, I, I I know the eighties production now gets a, a lot of shit, but it was a, it was an exciting time, I think, because people were trying to do funny stuff with sound. They were trying to not make it sound like it was a bunch of musicians in a room with the drums here and the guitar there, and they were trying to do strange things with things. With hi hats didn't sound like hi hats, and records that didn't have any cymbals and strange whatever the effects were and it what it was it did feel like a time where um sonically you know music was changing all the time so that really that was, was that that was really a really exciting time to be on board i was obsessed with of course obsessed with music and um obsessed with like bands and and being into sort of bands and the culture seemed to say so much about who you were and what your values were and the, the sort of politics i think that were going around in in rock music and pop music, I sort of feel like all my politics came from like rock and pop lyrics, you know, and then the band stances. And then that seemed to tie in with a lot of other cultural things for me at the time. There was some really cool stuff happening on the television, like a whole new wave of like things like the young ones and filthy rich and cat flap and the stuff with Rick mail and whatever that we had in the UK really sort of felt like, it felt like it was us. It felt like us against them. It felt like us that had infiltrated mainstream media, having grown up in the 70s with whatever TV was then. And this this new sort of strain came in, which was really hip to um, what was going on in the rock world. Clearly, they were part also part of this world or adjacent to it. And then also I was really, really, the other thing that really kind of got under my skin was like comics. Um um, yeah, so I was always into was like cool reading about that, you know, Tintin and Asterix and that kind of thing. But then there was a, a British comic called 2000 AD. Now, loads of the loads of these artists and writers from 2000 AD ended up getting sort of poached by um, Marvel and DC because they were so good. But this one comic called 2000 AD, which is all black and white pen and ink artwork, which I love, and really quite subversive ideas. It was this really kind of dystopian satire and really savage and it was maybe you'd get like seven eight stories per week every week and then each one would be three or five pages or something and you the, it re and again that felt very adjacent to what the music that i was listening to and you'd often see the bands wearing 2000 ad t-shirts or you'd have references to bands and stuff in 2000 ad and same thing with what was going on in tv and the comedy and stuff and it it all felt like this was our culture, for me at the time, really, really, it, it was a really exciting time. So I can't remember what the question was now, but um, no, so, it's but all that, good. It was that like was, your I guess that was with against what the school, what my school seemed very much like a throwback to almost like the post-war schools of the 1950s or something. Oh, yeah, it did. Um, it did. Kind of thing, because it was a private school. It didn't, it wasn't subject to the same sort of rules that were happening to the rest of the British schools. So whereas I, mean, I had to go to school on Saturdays, which was like oh my, a real you track. Did? Yeah, man. And then So you went to school six days a week? Yeah, yeah. Well Shit. Saturday after, up until twelve forty five, you know. That's um, nuts, man. That's yeah, was, obscene actually. What a track. Wow. That was, yeah. That <laughs> fucking sucked. So that was um freaking awful. And man. then but then um um, I was going to make a, a vague point about uh, so so yeah so that was that, whereas the rest of the schools had got rid of things like corporal uh, capital corporal corporal punishment Cor corporal uh, punishment yeah. yeah yeah our school hadn't because it didn't have to it wasn't subject to those um it wasn't subject to those sort of laws um so we still had that and there was no girls uh, until the sixth form so it was it oh was pretty God. hard you know it was pretty austere yeah, kind of school but um. But then you found your – it wasn't all awful, and I think it it makes – like you say, it did, does stiffen your resolve. It made you like – What doesn't know. kill you makes you stronger, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> the old cliche, well, but yeah. It was interesting. Uh, I I was nice reading the, the bits about like a band's coming to town and you're enthusiastic. I'm like, I can't believe we're going to actually see Iron Maiden or, you oh, know, or the new – or that con – that, that, uh, con the sort of the comic convention you went to where you had that artist where you were like kind of hanging out with Brian them all Talbot. Day. Yeah. God. Yeah. A major, major artist, you know, and I, I reconnected um, with him when I made that book, uh, all these did years you later. Really? Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're in that, touch now. Oh it's my God. That's actually. so cool. Um, I did a little, I did a little intro for him. He just brought out a new book, uh, the third part of his Luther Arkwright 
thing, which he was writing when I met him all the way back then. Wow. And um, he invited me to the launch and I said a few words. It's, it's incredible. It's really been amazing to reconnect with this guy after all those years. Cause I, 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 he I was really him. cool to you back then even. Oh, he's brilliant, man. You know, and uh, you know, I got I got high with him recently. It was really nice. It was just, 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 <laughs> so, that's wild. Yeah, didn't he? Didn't he, really didn't he get high in the book or something? I, think I, I missed talking. that bit out. I missed that bit out. Um, and um, he said, "Oh, you should have put that in." When I spoke to him, but basically, I was at this spent this day with him at this comic convention in 1987. And at one point, he said, um, "Oh, would you mind, Carvers? Would you late run in the afternoon?" He said, oh, "Would you mind?" Um, you know, watching the table for me just for five minutes. I've got to speak to that guy over there. He's going to get me some dope. <laughs> it just seems like it was no way. Wow. I had quite a sheltered life. My, my parents are pretty straight, you know, and uh, for me, it was just, Oh God, this is, this is so exciting. He's this real intellectual. He knows loads of stuff about the counterculture. He's this brilliant artist, a writer, and he's going to get some dope. So it's, it was quite nice all this year, 30 odd years later to, uh, to get him to high get high with the guy. Oh, yeah. That's so wild. <laughs> yeah. That's so wild. Um, okay, so there were several bands that really changed your life music and per musically and personally. Amongst them, Stray Cats, Iron Maiden, Voivod, The Smiths, Gong, Cardiacs. Maybe choose two of them, and I know it's hard to choose, um, and talk well, about I, well, the I impact. Could, yeah. Yeah, I can. Well, I'll choose Iron Maiden and I'll choose Cardiacs because there's a nice. I was thinking about this today about when you sent the questions, and I went for a walk and was trying to think about the answers. And I real I realized even now that that you know there's there's an interesting segue between one and the other. But I mean, obviously, just to briefly touch on Stray Cats, that was the. Um, I always used to hear music in my head and stuff, and it, obviously, I I recently got into sort of watching Top of the Pops and and what have you. But then seeing Stray Cats on top of the pops and seeing the three of them there, and they looked so different to everything else that was out there. Yes. And obviously Brian Setz is a, a still, at, you know, totally love his playing. I mean, I've, I have a Gretsch guitar over there as a, as a result of my Setzer obsession. But um, that was the, that, and it was, it was everything it was the image. It was the sound. It was the extraordinary guitar playing. That's when I went, Oh, you're right. That, that's how it, I could see how the cake was made. He's singing that stuff and playing that. He's doing that. He's doing that. And it was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, wow. And so I was really, really like, and, I, and I, I'll use the word obsessed a lot because when I when I get into something, it's it's all I can think about. And I, when I got into the Stray Cats, I just couldn't stop thinking about them, couldn't stop listening to them. It, it sort of just took over until I heard um, Iron Maiden on top of the pops in 1982. <laughs> They I couldn't imagine run. seeing Iron Maiden on top of the pops. That's pretty wild. It was the video for Run to the Hill. So Bruce had just joined. He'd only been in, you know, at that point, a few months. Um, and um, they did run, run to the hills on top of the pops. And I'd, I'd never heard music like it. It seemed so sort of otherworldly, in fact. It was so wild and unhinged. It seemed like just craziness. The, the sound, the sound of the guitar playing, you know, the, the Dave Murray solo and all those swoops and bends, it just seemed, I, I, you know, and the speed and the intensity, and then you know, you the, buying the buying that single, you know, getting run to the hills, um, and seeing the artwork, which was also just had this real charge to it, so and powerful, because of that, you know, it's really powerful, and then. The more kind of getting into it, and, and because also in, in those days, it's not like now where you can find out everything you want to know about a band. It, they, bands were still really mysterious, and um, very much, you know, Iron Maiden. All you had was these brief, these photos of them that would appear on the records or in Kerrang, and then these like you know the the strange sleeve notes, and then these covers which seemed to have a real narrative to them. And of course, for me, I I projected onto Iron Maiden, I, I projected onto them maybe in some ways, maybe far more than they thought that, I don't know, far more that was there. I don't know, because that's what you do with music anyway. But I just totally bought into this kind of strangeness that was Iron Maiden. And, um, and again, and again, was, you know, really obsessed with them. And that's sort of, I was, they, they were sort of my favorite band for, you know, for between 1982 and 1988. And I think for me, that was that arc of the really brilliant, albums I, and i love the first two as well but yeah um but what, what really did it for me about iron maiden was um 
that it, they seemed to have it was almost like they were a high concept band not not exactly like the residents or or diva or something but they, they had that vibe it was like the the artwork was really unified they had the same logo Derek Riggs's art was incredible and it seemed to all relate to the music and back then particularly the more sort of less interested in the kind of war lyrics but there was kind of there was sort of like they had these mystical lyrics or at least it seemed to be to me and um I just tied in my head. I tied all these elements together: the sort of the, the mystical lyrics with the the beautiful like guitar harmonies. I mean, it was just, for me the highlights of each song was the guitar solos. You know, yeah, they're phenom- that, They are phenomenal players. And those two together playing for me, Adrian Smith and Dave Murray, their, their styles were so different. You know, but they really, really sort of complemented each other. And each the the. To, in my mind as well, the, the lyric, the guitar solo seemed to almost be like a kind of a explanation of the narrative of the song. It, it was like they were summing up what the song was about, but just in these like 16 bars or whatever. And the, the solos really had a narrative to them. I could hear how that, the, the shape of them and the adventure that they went on really fed into my understanding of what the lyrics seemed to be about, or at least what I was projecting onto the lyrics to be about. And I loved all that. I really loved those harmony guitar parts as well. And, you know, it, 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 there was a real magic to Iron Maiden, you know, and um, I, I'll admit a lot of it was projected on them by me. But uh, but you that's, know, were, and, that's what music does. And yeah. that's the cool thing about it. Because you could have had another guy sitting at the other side of the concert hall watching them doing the same thing, but totally different projections. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's like what's so cool about music. It and just touch you. Here's, Here's a funny thing about the imagination anyway, because, okay, so there's a there's a degree to which, you know, and maybe I'd, I'd think this if I heard them right now, if I'd never heard them before, you'd go, well, hang on a minute. It's all just E minor, C and D, you know, and it's all just, <laughs> all your songs, are, or, you know, D minor, D, D minor, C and B flat. It's all just that. And it's in these harmony parts and it's all, you, you could say that. Um, but... Oh God, I'm going to go a bit of a roundabout way, but there was this there was this Enid Blyton book that I was really really into when I was a, a, a kid, and it's called the the Magic Far Away Tree. There's these three books: the um, Enchanted Wood, the Magic Far Away Tree, and the Children of the Far Away Tree. And uh, you know, Enid what's, Blyton what's her name? Be the, uh, the, it was three: the Far Away Tree book. No, what, what's the author's name? Oh, Enid Blyton. Okay, she's like I suppose the um, well, you know, I know uh, sort of like the the. Older, you know, what wartime era? Oh, I, actually, I can't even tell you when she was writing. Maybe J.K. Rowling or whatever. She wasn't a great writer, but it was packed with all these ideas. And you know, these these ideas really got under my skin as a kid. And I can remember that you know, from these brief descriptions of what was going on and the the locations, the you know, the uh, Moonface's house and all these worlds. They, they'd go to these different worlds, changing worlds at the top of this tree, the faraway tree. And I, I can remember exactly how I used to feel that these worlds looked and these places looked. I really seemed to, you know, be a, have a three D version of them. And then years later, you know, in, as as a middle aged man reading these stories to my daughter, um, as I'm reading these descriptions, I'm right back in the same way I imagined these worlds when I was, you know, five or six, four or five, whatever I was. And I get the same thing with Iron Maiden when I listen back to those albums. I can't hear them as I can't hear the sort of I don't want to say deficiencies. I can't hear the the limitations of them. I can as soon as I hear the middle section of the duelists, or as soon as I hear like strange world, I'm completely transported back to the mental images I'd get at the time. You know, it's not like I, I can't I can't listen to them with critical ears at all, which I can to their later work. You know, but the stuff when I was a kid, it, I'm still right back there you know they're still like just really loaded with meaning the those tunes so um that's so yeah, cool i think that's great yeah so that was my um they were my thing and also just the way that they the one thing without you know something about i think and i think the same is true with heavy metal as just in general but it's you, it irony doesn't work in that you, you've got to be sincere you know you you have to be actually um completely sincere and that's what i got with iron maiden is just this extraordinary passion and sincerity about what they're doing you know they're 
absolutely playing on the top of their game. You know, yeah. they're not fucking about. They're never dialing it Definitely in. It's not. never like, this will do. And while you might think that you might hear some stuff that's far more sophisticated or far more complex, or, I, you know, I don't know, there, there, there's something about that total sincerity as to, to what they're doing that, that really, really got to me. It, it reminds me... Um, a great quote from David Lee Roth, you know, the, uh, the, Mark, the, the Mark Twain of uh, the 21st and 21st century. As he said, um, I won't try and do the accent, but he says, uh, it, take, it takes sincerity to make it in this game. Once you can fake that, you got it made. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very uh, appropriate David Lee quote. Oh, I that's love funny, it. Yeah, man. So many. Yeah. Elements. That's so they, funny. They asked, him in the, they asked him in the 80s. So Once Dave, you can fake that, you got it made. You, you that's got it awesome. Made. They said to him in the eighties. They asked him, um, "So, Dave, who's your uh, who's your favorite heavy metal band?" He said, "Well, now, seeing as how they all sound the same, I love them all." <laughs> That's so funny. Once you can fake sincerity, you got it. It, it takes sincerity to make it in this game. Once you can fake that, you got it made. That's great. Funny man. It's funny you mentioned Kerrang. Because yeah. I used to read that in the 80s. Yeah. And I remember we didn't have a metal ma a magazine devoted, not on that level. Didn't to you have metal. Circus or Circus? But it was a lot of stuff in there. Kerrang! was like, you know, except Iron It was yeah. hardcore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it was metal. You know, Raw, yeah. Judas Priest. It was It was 100%. And it was really cool because we used to get this thing and it was... It, that was like, uh, so we didn't have that much. Ex we had far less exposure to British things than you probably had to American things. So it was really cool to get this magazine, except the size never fit in on the cabinets with your other ones because you're A5 or the paper's different. But um, it was such a cool magazine. And you like, you'd open it up. It was in plastic. And it was like, wow. This is from England, and that's where these bands are from. So these guys really know their shit. At least that's you know that was the the projection, you know. And uh, and it was the I, only was, way you could hear what the great. likes. Of, yeah, and it was the only place you could really hear what the likes of um, Lemmy or you know Iron Maiden whatever had to say. Right, and um, these people it, felt like outlaws. You know, it really they really felt like. I remember when you'd see them occasionally turn up on TV. Especially like seeing like thin, you know, Phil Linnett turn up or Lemmy or, or, or whatever. They, they really seemed like these were just outlaws stepping in. They didn't seem like they could easily transfer to have a TV career or, or something else. It was. It, yeah, you, you couldn't know, see him having a lips. cup of tea in a, in a, a, you know, a diner somewhere or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was it, that was a good experience. It's funny you said it because I remember it, it probably wasn't until for me I, I wasn't that at, at least growing up um, at the time I wasn't really that into I'm trying to think if there's any American artists I dug until um, that sort of wave of uh, stuff like Slayer and Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth that, that 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 thing came in, and that's when I started to really dig into American music, and then. Other stuff followed, like you know, Sonic Youth, right. and then um, I'm trying to think what else at the time, that I, and then Melvins, and that, that kind of whole thing. But um, at the time, it was really, it was really Brit just British stuff. I mean, you know, as well as as well as like I say in the book, as well as like you know, Iron Maiden and uh, the British metal stuff. And I I used to like Kiss actually. That was an American band I liked. I like Kiss again. Right. I like the theatrics of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. But apart from that, it was. Um, you know, I think it was sort of like the Smiths and Kate Bush and the Jesus and Mary chain and, you know, whatever was the madness, obviously, all the time, but whatever was going on in the UK. And even Stray Cats felt like a British band because they had to come over here to to sort of get signed. Um, <laughs> and Well, not quite like a British band, but they were, you know, they certainly, there wasn't any stuff that I was hearing in America that sounded like them. So then when, well, then I got a lot more turned on to American stuff with, the, with that wave of like the sort of thrash thing. Well, you look at like what's odd is that you look at like the Stones, Clapton, um, Led Zeppelin, they did the much better version. <clears throat> you know, they made, they electrified all these old American blues guys, you know, and nobody else has done it as good as those guys, as far as I'm concerned, ever since. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's weird. You get something from another country, maybe. 
I mean, I don't know if this theory stands up especially, but there was definitely a sort of to and from thing, to and fro thing going, I thought, in terms of like metal. And to, to make it clear, you know, metal, it's, I, I was sort of kind of off the metal train really in about the early 90s, or I still love it. But I always like to make it I always, I just love music, you know, it, and metal was just, it was really good because it was like outsider music. It was the good, you know, weirdos, good music for weirdos. But there, there seemed to be a real to and fro thing with uh, across the channel because you'd have like the sort of new wave of British heavy metal thing happening. And then then a, a few years later, then you had the big the thrash thing happening in the in the US. Mm-hmm. And I think I there, there, there were, I mean, there was a few British thrash bands and God knows I tried my hand at one. Um, but I don't think we really, there were really that any bands in the UK that could hold a candle up to the American ones. There were, I mean, maybe there was Sabat, but I think largely it was a second rate thing um, here. But then what do, what the UK does then take from Thrash is then the UK, so we had those bands like uh, N- Napalm Death and Carcass and sort of, you know, the kind of bolt thrower and the kind of grindcore thing. And then that kind of, then then that becomes something. And then the, then the Americans sort of like, then they take that and create like a maybe death metal. And so, so it felt like there was a, a, a real a question and answer thing going on between yeah. uh, for a while anyway, you know. Yeah, I could see that for sure, man. So talk about your love of cardiacs now, man, because I know so that's... cardiacs comes along. So the, the the way it ties in with um oh god, I can really tie these two bands in actually. But um the, way, the what happened then? When, when I'd left school and I joined college, and I was um sixteen. And in fact, that summer I mentioned this in the book. That summer I was like Iron Maiden had put out um Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, and that was really the last record by them I truly loved. And I think a lot of this is an age thing as well, because for me, once Adrian Smith goes, uh, who was my favourite member, um, they, you know, I, I kind of got off the, I got off the bus there, and I was changing anyway. You know, you you want different things from music. Um, but Absolutely. I saw, I saw Maiden play that summer. I saw them play at Donington in 1988, which is brilliant, you know. And then I I went to I'd left school. I went to this sort of further education uh, college. And I met a guy who turned me on to this Cardiacs album, A Little Man in a House and the Whole World Window, their first proper LP mm. album, which had just been released. I knew nothing about this band at all. Um, and I, I took it home, and it's just, again, talk about it, it, it was everything I wanted, but I didn't know it's, that's what I wanted. And I heard it, and it just went so deep, so incredibly deep for me on the first listen. Um, and, and like Iron Maiden, they they also – had this kind of high concept band. They had a sort of like a, a, a real mystique around them. Like they were this strange cult. The records all had a vibe to them. But the, at the heart of it, the composition and the, the production and just everything about the music, I, I had never heard anything like it before and just couldn't, could not believe what I was hearing. Couldn't believe this band was making music like this. And I, I was convinced that they were going to be like, a year later would be as big as, you know, the Beatles or, I don't know, whatever was the big thing at the time. You know, I, I just thought that's it. Once people hear this, that's it. It's the game over because nothing else came close, you know. And I I, I really was on a kind of, um, kind of what you call it, uh, like a mission to turn everyone onto this band. I, and again, couldn't stop thinking about them. And then that created quite a uh, schism in my head because I'd already started this metal band, Die Laughing. And I couldn't, I couldn't assimilate the music of Cardiacs. I could not assimilate it. It just seemed so beyond what I was capable of. Um, and in a way, the same year I discovered Voivod and Voivod seemed like they were like the metal cardiacs. I, was, I could un, I could understand more That's what Voivod were doing. I, I could assimilate that more into what I was doing because I could hear this was the sound of a, a guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. Whereas cardiacs, I could I knew it was horns and keys and lots and lots of funny noises. Uh, but there's a lot just, of moving parts in cardiacs. A lot of moving parts. Yeah, a lot going on, and that really at, at the time being a quite hyperactive. Teen, it just it was just so appealing, and um, for me as a as a sort of um, sixteen year old, it it, it completely. Um, I mean, it did change my life in every way. I mean, I ended up moving to London because I wanted to 
be part of whatever whatever that thing was that they were doing. Um, and it, it sounds like a funny thing to say, but I knew that Tim uh, Smith, Tim Smith, who's, who was the he was the you know the guy responsible for the music and the everything really you know i knew him and i would be friends i kind of that that i kind of knew of oh, this because there's got to be a connection there yeah i never i never really felt like i wanted to meet um brian setter i still never met him and i know like the guys whatever he's in we probably would get all musicians get on right ultimately yeah. i think but most most musicians get on i think pretty much everybody uh, yeah i mean everybody you I know, know I, I think you know you just show um, up and if you know oh i do this too and it's like you know you're in the club but like yeah exactly but i never i never felt like i needed to meet brian setter i did you know it's like he's into the hot rods and whatever it's just and even the same with iron maiden they're into like football and this and that it's like okay what whatevs but with Tim, maybe there was a mistake about it or, or him, but I, I kind of knew, all right, I, I feel like we're going to be friends. And, of course, when we when we actually became sort of best friends, which happened very quickly, um, we're, of course we were into exactly the same stuff, and or, or largely, and we, we, we really, really got on extremely well. You know, we became close, you know, very, very quickly. But the, the music touched me so much, and – Getting getting back to what I was saying earlier is that if you if you put if you put your soul into something, then um it 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 takes on a life, you know. And clearly with cardiacs and with everything that Tim did, he totally put the soul into it. I mean, that is the sound of Tim. That isn't the sound of Tim trying to be this, this, or that. You know, what you're hearing, whether it's cardiacs, whether it's sea nymphs, whether it's his solo stuff, whether any it's Spratley's, anything anything that that guy recorded or did in fact he was such a sort of all-round artist as a filmmaker or as a w whatever it was he did it, he put his soul into it and um and you could tell that you, you you could tell you know that that music is him you know and uh so that was um so when we did eventually meet it that what me finally joining the band later on or certainly becoming part of that whole little um you know nexus did didn't kind of seem that surprising it was like because oh, well, you were where you're supposed to be yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's like, oh well this happens now you know yeah and that's I mean, a cool put... feeling when you when you it's happened to me on the show a couple of times when i said oh, I, i'll have that guy on my show or, or something like that and i just i don't rush i don't push but I, I just know that that's going to eventually happen, and it's yeah. such a cool feeling, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, I mean, you make you you make every, every decision you make, and I think if you know, sort of think, I think about you know music all the time, all the time. I'm thinking about it, um, and you know, every decision you're making whether you want to call it manifesting or whether you want to call it magic. And I like to call it magic because it's, it makes things more fun, but yes. you're, all, all these micro decisions like that. that you're doing, you're, you're doing it in order to sort of like be where you need to be or where you would like to be partly moving to London. I mean, you know, it wasn't that I, I kind of thought, well, now I'm going to be hanging out with Tim and cardiacs and now I'm going to be part of that world. It's just like, well, it's not going to happen when I'm in Plymouth. I'm not, and certainly there's not <laughs> enough people. <laughs> yeah. you know, there, there weren't enough people in Plymouth. Uh, there, there are so few bands or artists, you know, that are bands that really ever came from Plymouth. I mean, you take a. Where, where like is Plymouth? Plymouth? It's in the southwest. Um, okay. It's just before you get to Cornwall. Okay. Um, so, uh, like, if, 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 if this is the UK and you've got London here, mm -hmm. like Plymouth's sort of down there and yeah. Scotland up there. Plymouth is sort of down there. Um, so not many bands came there, and there was a really cool like, music scene there. Um, certainly, when I was a teenager, lots of lots of other musicians, but it we just could people just couldn't get out, couldn't get it out of Plymouth. And I think had there been any sort of coverage, I mean, there was a. I mean, sometimes it takes a band to sort of break out in order, for, yeah. in order to to shine a light. I mean, so th there was. In the early early nineties, I think there was a big thing going on with Bristol. Now Bristol's sort of before you, it's actually not far from me. Bristol's more like here. Okay. And at the time, there were very few bands. I mean, there was a, a few bands, that, notable bands that had come from Bristol, 
But it wasn't until like Portis Head and then Tricky and then Massive Attack that then a, a real sort of searchlight was put onto Bristol and people saw what cool music was going on there. I like Massive Attack. It was a scene, you know. And I think we, we, we had our own scene. There's some really cool bands in Plymouth, but it was just completely isolated. It was living almost like in, in a bubble. So it became obvious that like if I really want to do this thing and be around like-minded people, got to move, we've got to move to London with this, you know. That's good. How and old so were you? Then you part of that cardiac nexus, you know, and you know you got to, and again you you, you got to hustle. And I remember seeing I'd been living here um, with my then girlfriend for about I'd been living for about a year, and I remember seeing um, um, in our local pub we'd moved to an area called Hackney. Oh our yeah, local yeah. Pub, you know, Hackney was cool. I'd lived there, you know, for pretty much 30 years. And in our local pub, I remember seeing, like, uh, seeing a guy that I knew worked for Cardiacs because I'd seen him on stage. And I saw him and I said to Andrea, that guy works for Cardiacs. Fucking hell. And um, so the next Cardiac show, I, I spoke to him afterwards. And I was like, oh, man, I saw you in a, saw you in a pub in Hackney. Um you know, I said, you know, uh, I've just moved there. And he said, oh, yeah, me too. Do you want to, you know, do you want to meet up for a drink? So I said, yeah, sure. The guy called Captain John. Um, and so we had a drink and, you know, at, at the end of it, after a few drinks, I said, and, you know, I've never guitar teched in my life. But uh, after a few drinks, I said, well, you, you've got my number. If ever Cardiacs need a guitar tech, you know, hit me up, you know, just let me hit me up. Now, I'd met him a few times and he'd seen my band play uh, the Monsoon Bassoon in London. He must, He must have, like, kind of had a good feeling about me because he never got people in for professional reasons. He got people in because he got on with them. Right. Uh, and I was, I was at college up here, up there sort of doing a uh, music technology. And then I came in what, about two weeks later, I came in one evening and my girlfriend said, you're never, you're not going to believe this. Tim Smith was on the phone. They're, um, they're going on tour in a few weeks. They need a guitar tech. And it was, Holy so, you know, so your, your buddy went so and told them, you know, and that was, wow. you know, that was that. Did you feel, um, that's an un, that's an un, uncommon thing for musicians to do. A lot of guys feel really awkward about. We we talked about this a little bit before we started recording uh, about marketing themselves or sort of saying, "Hey, if you have this happens, you know, I'd love you to think of me, or I'd love a shot at this." Um, was that difficult for you to do, or was it just so? Well, I know I need to do this. Um. Yeah, I think it was. I think it's been kind of, uh, yes, yeah, so I suppose driven and not being uh, ambitious, but you know, I wanted to, I definitely wanted to, I knew I wanted to be part of this kind of scene because it just felt really like it just felt like this is, you know, the music that they were doing and the bands relate the bands sort of connected to Cardiacs or with, you know, members of Cardiacs. The little sort of circle of bands around them was just what i was into right and um you know i i that, that that i'd been drawn to it anyway that 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 kind of thing so it wasn't it was never a kind of like cynical well uh, move just that I, I wanted to be part of this i wanted yeah. to be in this gang it seemed really that's where i needed to be um so go ahead but i mean but, but regarding hustling it's a strange one because i think as long as you're keeping your art absolutely pure and you're doing it for well, whatever reasons you believe are the, the the correct reasons, right? I think you you do need to, and I'm you know it's you know you need to hustle. And you have I to. Think, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. I, yeah. I can think of friends of mine who I think are much better composers than I am. Much better guitar players, better singers, better you know better what everything that that um, just don't really hustle, um, and I and they're. It's just, it, it's not happening as as much for them. It's, and you I you think, suffer for it. Yeah, and I can think of people I know who friends or no, not so friends who I just think they're kind of it's, it's like really I'm not hearing what the thing is, but they hustle. You know, they they hustle more than me. And some yeah. people I've seen I've seen people hustle. And I think God, that's shameless. I couldn't I couldn't do that. But there is a degree to which even on, even on the most basic thing where you, you you meet someone and they say, "Oh, I've got a tour coming up," and go, oh, "Do you need do you need an opening act for that tour? Do you need me to open? I'll, I'll open that gig. I'm a, I'm a really easy. I'm a really easy date. I don't take up much floor space. I turn up with my <laughs> home and they're like, "Yeah, sure, yeah, we'll do that." I mean, you've got to you've just got to be doing that hustle. Same thing with us, you know. Well, would you need to get? I was doing this with you know, 
uh, with bands, even even if it's just I've got some free time. Well, do you need a guitar player? I did this with a band called Guapo. I saw him play. Yeah. I knew those guys. And I remember seeing him in about two I, – I was already friends with them, and they really sort of turned a corner in about 2001. I remember seeing him perform this piece called Five Sons in London. And we were sort of contemporaries. You know, my band had split up. And um, they were playing this stuff, and I could hear this influence of, like, Magma – and of bands like Universe Zero and also of Henry Cow and King Crimson. And did, did, all this stuff was like, th this is my, this is my kind of language. And I just thought, and I just said, you know, if you ever need a guitar player, you know, you, there's no one else that can do this. No one else gets what, no one else gets what you're doing like I do. Not in this right. city anyway. So if you need a guitar player and then two or three years later, I got the call. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to do an extended lineup. We want a guitar player, you know. So, I mean, it's just that, really. It was I would never say that to a, a group if I wasn't feeling it, but I heard, I knew ex all the influences. It was like, well, there's no one else that really gets this uh, than me. And so I, I think it helps if, you, if you're easy go, if you're easy to get on with as well, I think. Oh, that's everything in music. I mean, you're going to be on the road with someone sleeping in a wherever with them for you know you're, you're on stage for an hour the rest of the time it's like if you're an asshole it's not it's not a fun experience and, for anybody and what other job is there where you spend all day you know from the moment you wake up you're in a room with one of your co-workers and then right. to the moment you go to bed you know you really i mean i try and go for a walk after sound check my big thing is just to go off for a walk just to have a bit of time to myself but sure you, you've, you've got to be able to get on with people or else yeah. you've got to be re either paying Either you've got to get on with people or else you've got to be signing the checks and be, like, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, be really gifted or something because otherwise it's like, well, yeah, it's, an, you know, it's, why would it's, I, why would I want to make my life misery? You know? Right. Right. So let me ask you a question. When stuff like this happens and it falls into place, right? What is your personal viewpoint? Again, to whatever extent you're comfortable, do you feel like there's uh natural law or do you feel like, there is some higher power helping you or random luck or right place, right time. Like, do you look at any of that stuff? Cause I always, you know, there was this movie. It's a great, it's not the greatest movie, but it's a great example of this. It was a movie with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and sliding guy, doors. Yes. Okay. My, my friend, Steve Davis talks about this a lot. Uh, so he's very, very big on the sliding doors thing that, yeah, I saw it years ago, but he uses that analogy a lot. Yeah. You know, she's, she leaves the house 30 seconds later. So she doesn't get down the train uh, to make this and her whole fucking life is different. And you know, you make a left turn to go here instead of a right. How do you look at that? Do you think like, what is your perspective on this? I'm always curious about that. Well, I'm, uh, it's interesting. Cause I mean, if you take the, um, I don't know if you know the sort of um, podcaster and sort of philosopher guy Sam Harris, but he uh, he's uh, the meditation about, guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly the yeah. meditation guy. He's got a thing about free will, and his thing is that there is no such thing as free will, and um, but you've got to behave as if there is. But there's no such thing as free will, and actually everything is just playing out and. The, if I think about that, there might be something in it. You know, sometimes I think, yeah, maybe that is it. And then maybe we are just really just playing out whatever um, wiring up and plumbing to DNA that that we are, you know, because we are merely, we are merely, we are merely these flesh avatars. Um, we're vessels of time. We are, yeah. the experience, there is this one eternal, got it. We're going to go deep now. There's this one unchanging moment of eternity. And we are all merely fleshy avatars experiencing ourselves. And that's how we get to experience time through aging. And time is good and aging is good because there's no such thing as time and there's no such thing as space. But in this weird frequency that we find ourselves in, there is. And then we get to experience things like music because music can't exist in a single moment of eternity. Yet we have to experience time to do it. And so, and that maybe we're just experiencing our fleshy avatars playing out, playing out these, playing out whatever, like it was almost like clockwork. We've been dialed up and watching this thing play out its thing until it, it collapses, atrophies. I don't know. So there is that argument. Uh, and then you could say, well, everything is, you know, it's all part of, you know, the, the universe expanding, whatever with this weird thing playing out is all part of that. But alternatively, it does feel like we have got free will and it does feel like we've got agency and we're in 
we're in control of what we're doing. And certainly I like this, you know, you, you've got to act as if, as if you do have free will. Um, but I, I, I think it's, yeah, it, I guess it's sort of right place and right time is a lot to do with it. But then the older I've got, the more I've just thought, and this, this isn't to sound in any way arrogant, but, um, it's just, I just think on everything, well, if not me, then who? You know, when stuff happens, and because some big things have happened where I, if I w was to sort of really look at it, which I don't really, but if I was to look at the um, responsibility of it, say like joining a band like Gong and then having to front Gong and what a big deal that was. And if I really looked at that from a fan perspective, and if I treated that too much like it was a, a sacred thing, like Gong is, oh, it mustn't be, it must be, then I couldn't do it. You know, you, you have to have a degree to which you've got to sort of own, own the part, yeah, and, and make it make it mine. And with, with the Gong thing, I just have to go. Well, if not me, then who? You 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 can't allow yourself to think like someone else could have done this better or someone because it is a sliding door thing. It could have been someone else, you know, and right. they would have done it differently. But it wasn't someone else; it was me. And so now I've got to do the absolute best I can right. with this. Um, and it's and it's the same with with everything that I've done. It's not that I've ever I've never ever wanted to sort of shit on anyone or stand on someone's shoulders in order to make things happen for me. But I'm I'm you know I'm I'm pretty driven and it, and it is like just trying to you know a, a, because you oh god what what am I trying to say you, it's not about being you know ever sacrificing what it is you feel is you know your vision yeah but yeah in order, to, in order to you know you know how hard it is to you know to to get ahead and in I I just want as many people to hear that that will like my stuff. Whatever it is, and actually, there's no difference for me whether it's Gong, whether it's Utopia Strong, whether it's my solo stuff, whether it's Knife World. It's it's all the same thing. I mean, I've got a stink that I bring to stuff, and I've got an approach that I bring to stuff. And whether it's working with other people as a democracy, or improvising, or whether it's being the sort of benign dictator or, or not so benign dictator, um, you know, I've I've got an idea of what I want this stuff to do, and I would never ever want to compromise that. I'd certainly never. I'd have no idea as to how to make my stuff more appealing because it's it's very niche anyway. I don't think that's possible. I mean, yeah, I had one guest on out of nine. It was Dave Mason, and Dave Mason was telling me that um, I knew. He, I think I asked him what happened with traffic, maybe, and he goes, "Well, I wanted to write pop hit singles, and they didn't want that." something like that i've never heard anybody say you know like his intention was to write that and that was unusual and he was great at it obviously but i've never that was the only time i've heard something like that and i think yeah. by and large just a very minority sort of thought process for musicians I mean, in my mind, I am writing pop songs, but, um, you know, they, <laughs> not everybody. I, Dude, I, I you know what? Really, but that is, that's a, a trip that's attributed to your, hey, I'm being myself. That's my yeah. pop song, right? So, I mean, I, I totally get that, actually, because it's like you're writing pop songs. What else? How else could I write? You know, what else would I do but this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, but I mean, so I never want, I would never, I mean, I, I think this is probably the same with certainly everyone I know um, in my, in my contemporaries is I think you're, 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 you're doing your thing. Uh, you're trying to do what someone else is. What was it? Um, oh, I'm misquoting. I think remember Van Dyke Park saying, do your thing, work hard at it, at it and don't be doing something that anyone else is doing and yeah. in, in my mind i'm doing that although obviously you can draw similarities with whatever because it's unavoidable um but you know uh beyond that of, of course I, I i want as many people to like that will like it to, to i wanted to try and get to the ears of as many people as i possibly can sure but i don't want to i don't want to compromise should. what it is i'm doing in order to do that you know sure so totally get that man yeah. God, how do you your recall of all these quotes? I, <laughs> you it's know not, not mine, nearly as good as it was. I've got to say, you know. So. Well, I'm telling you, like mine is. I this show has really 900 shows in five and a half years is really like 
like, you know, you have this much memory and it's like, it, I used to have a lot more of it empty, but now that I've done this. How, that how much, many shows? 900, like in five Whoa. or something. <laughs> yeah. So like I, my brain used to have that sort of like, you know, uh, capacity but like after this it's like i i it doesn't and i've just accepted it you know um tell me Kavis, what are the top three musical experiences you've had yeah i i, I struggle with this one actually um all those top all those name your top this list those are tough questions um uh yeah i struggled with this one um so okay so he, there's a couple that are like uh well, I mean, in terms of like making stuff, um, I think there was, I mean, there was, there was, um, okay, so, yeah, da, 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 da. okay, so one of, the, one of them was, uh, my, my best friend, um, a guy called Dan Chudley, who I write about in the book. You know, we met each other. He's a year and a half younger than me. And, you know, we, I was doing a metal band called Die Laughing. And then we, we really, just found each other. I don't know why it was because you know on the on the face of it, it seemed very different. But quite early on, you know, I'm I'm very very verbose. He's a man of few words, but everything he says is brilliant. You know, real incredible sort of like uh, take on the world. Um, and um, you know, once once we met each other, we just pretty much for the next fifteen years started writing exclusively together um and saw each other pretty much every day except for the first year that I moved to London and then he followed but and then it was terrible not working with him anymore and we did everything together and um we we sort of progressed out of that band die laughing into the next band was called the monsoon bassoon, which was very much the kind of you know the the band we were trying to turn into. Um, but I remember we used to, and we used to sort of take LSD together and, and, and write, write tunes. And I just remember this, this track called Aladdin that he'd come up with this main thing and then we worked on it together and then wrote this song, um, during an LSD trip called Alad the Aladdin trip. And that's when we decided to move to London. That was, and the fact that lots and lots of stuff was revealed to me on this trip, my sort of my, my path in what I call funny music. I called it the bent path. Um, it was like, became really clear at the age of like 19 was, oh, no, I was a bit older than actually that, that time was about 20. And I just my the, the path I had to take w w almost opened up to me. It's like, okay, this is my world. Th this kind of, whatever it is, this strange, angular, dissonant sort of, you know, one cog doing one thing in one orbit, another cog doing another orbit, you know, seven against five, all that kind of, whatever it was that we were doing. Um, and I've sort of continued to do, it really became absolutely kind of crystallized on this one particular trip. And then this track, Aladdin, got written. And it was really one of those kind of, I can't believe we've written this. I can't believe this. We, we've, can't believe this is our track. This is like, this is now this, this is what I'm talking about. It really felt like the first, actually the first time, really up until that point, having been writing, attempting to write songs, since I was in single figures, I think there it was like, yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're doing something that's like we, we got we got something here, you know. Um, so that was a big that was a big deal because once we'd opened that door, there was no going back. It's like okay, this this is the you know th this is like a sort of a collective plateau that, and it was a three or four minute tune. Very it, it in retrospect is a cross between sort of um, eighties crimson and. Um, like gong uh but you know it, it felt like we'd something had happened there so that was that and, was and that's on deal. it's on the monsoon bassoon record no it's not actually we've we never released it it was st it's still unreleased so uh, Dude, what really the hell good, i know we got a really good recording of it uh produced by tim smith but we never released it but back then we were progressing so quickly in our 20s that every couple of months we were always we were writing songs all the time i mean me and dan were together every day writing stuff together and the band was we all we, we basically the, the whole band lived within two houses so we were all living together we really were it was like a cult uh in a way and the, the music was sort of progressing so much that although we recorded this track by the time we got to like making our album um we sort of moved on and, and and I felt like 
I mean, I wish we put it out, really. You could have done it as a B-side, but we sort of felt like it was too derivative by the time we, we came to making an album. So it's still languishing. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm going to put this stuff out eventually. Dude, put that out sometime. Yeah, I know. Do you know what the... Do you know what the problem is for me is that once I've done something, because I've got, I've got to reissue that album as well, and we've got another at least one album's worth of unreleased stuff and B-sides. And like I say, a lot of it produced by Tim Smith, so it's brilliant. Yeah. My, my problem is is that once I've done something, then I've done that, and then now I want to do something new. So it, to, be, to, to put those records out and re oversee the remastering of Just them. Just put the song out. You don't have to get all. Yeah, well, we've got loads of them. I know I could do it on Bandcamp, but it would take about two or three weeks of my time. Right, and I, I kind it. of think, well, oh, that's two or three weeks I could be spending doing new music. Right. And it's all, and I, it's terrible because loads of people would like to hear that stuff. Well, that's and what I'm just, thinking. Yeah. And I it's, know, if you're but talking just, about that, it's like the apex, or that's like the, you know, you broke through a new plateau with that. Well, back, back in, you know, whenever it was, 92. But. Now, I, what I wish I could have just plug my brain to someone else's who's and to look. Can you just can you just deal with all this shit? This is what I want to <laughs> can you deal with this now? And I'll just carry on, and that'll just be out. So I, I think. But that said, I mean, it, it it will come out. I've been hanging out with the um old manager of our band um, who lives nearby in Bristol, and every time we have a few drinks, it's like we should we should really get onto this, shouldn't we? Put the band back together. <laughs> well, we, 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 you know, that's we're all friends. The band's all friends, actually. So, um, we were talking about this during lockdown because actually, when I was writing that book, we did um, I did a few zooms with all the guys from the old band, um, just to make sure I got my facts right. And so, look, did this happen? Because I wrote a lot about that band, the monsoons in the book, um, and it was the first time we'd all been together, you know, in a in a in a Zoom conversation. The first time we'd been together since I got married in like two thousand and three. Um, oh, wow. And it was so, so nice to like hang out with those guys again. And I'd still see all of them individually. You know, I'm still, we're still all friends. You know, the band never split up for any reason. Like, you know, we, we couldn't get on. It's just like, it's just, it was too hard being poor. And I think at that point, we'd, we're getting into like long term relationships and families. Yeah. And, it just became impossible to have that that level of commitment to a band because it was it was like being in a cult. You know, we we lived it, and it, we were only in that band. We you know we weren't doing a million other projects. We were living that band, and I don't know. It, it sort of ran its course. I wish it hadn't, and I was, you know, it sort of split up where really it should have. We should have just taken a, a hiatus of a few months, but. Yeah, so that was – I can't remember where I was going with it. But no, that was one musical moment. That was that, one that, mus okay. that writing that thing – because we wrote it when we were doing our old metal band, Die Laughing, but that really became the – the band couldn't play it. The rest of the band couldn't play this track we'd written. So that became the, yeah, we got to do a new band kind of song. <coughs> the, and it's called The Aladdin Trip. It's just called Aladdin. Oh, just called Aladdin. But we Did refer you, uh, how, to the LSD trip as the Aladdin trip because that's when everything seemed to come together for me and Dan. The moving to London, the, you know, we got to do something, you know, we, we just kind of, when we wrote that track, it was like, okay, yeah, we need a change now. We need we wow. need to do something else. Dude, I give you credit. I took acid once, and there's I couldn't even barely have a conversation, let alone sit, <laughs> sit down and, and hey, write man, a song. It, it was a and musical com conversation. I, I, yeah, I guess. I, I I can't even, if I smoke a little weed, have a conversation. I'm, I'm just completely like, you know, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wired up. I'm I'm wired up weird, you know. So uh, it means that I'm, you're probably capable of doing a lot of like uh, stuff that I just can't do, you know. So I don't know about that, but um, all right. So Dan Chudley, is, are you so you're still friends with Dan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. I stayed with him mm -hmm. um uh, last week. I oh, went cool. Down to see him instead. I mean, oh, yeah, no, he's he's you know we were best man at each other's weddings, and he's yeah he's just I love him, you know. That's awesome. All right, what else? Uh, another um, musical okay experience. another another funny Remember. one really just um was um in about i think 2018 um 2018 getting asked to play in china with gong um and which was That's really exciting. It was, a, it was a, a city called Shenzhen. I'd never heard of it. It's about Oh, that's where they have all the guitar uh manufacturers I think, correct? Is it? I'm ah. pretty sure that's where a lot of the guys go. Guys that have factories in China, I believe it's in 
send sh- whatever how are, whatever, send, yeah well it's got yeah. 28 million people there and we were told this place was the tech capital of china so i think they make all so it's it's that's probably what it is and it's about um 28 million people in one city can you imagine I, I that didn't, you know fuck i'm and from new york i couldn't even begin to imagine 28 million people 28 million people i'd never heard of it. i mean london's only like i think maybe actually i'm completely probably wrong about this but like 16 million or when there's when there's people working there or something i don't know but so 28 8 million people in shenzhen alone it was about two hours drive north of hong kong so it still had this kind of quite liberally western vibe to it mm-hmm. and they have a festival there a really cool festival called tomorrow uh like a three-day festival magma had played a couple of years earlier i think faust may have played as well and this this year they had gong 2018 so we knew nothing about the festival or China, but we went over there and I spent a few days there. It was, it was incredible. And um, the festival is sort of connected to this um, bookshop, sort of bookshop, record shop, bar and cafe. This place stays open till um, like, you know, two, three in the morning. And we were there for about three days, I think, or two or three days before we actually played. The festival was on. And each night you go, you go into the cafe bar and just hanging out with these amazing people. It was such a cool scene. And I mean, we knew, you know, it's it's kind of like a kind of corny thing to say, but it's true. I knew it anyway, is that, you know, the the real, the the real problem is, is governments and authority and leaders, not people, you know, and you go there and everybody just wants the the world over. As far as I can tell, people just want the same thing. People just want to just get on and experience cool stuff and, you know, not fuck with other people, you know. And yeah. Certainly one real, you know, I'd say privilege about music and uh, being a musician is that you, you really get to meet like-minded people. And I think, you know, musicians, you know, all my friends, almost all my friends are musicians. And uh, maybe it's just because they're easier to relate to because we just talk music. But, um but, uh, you know, and as an outsider that's kind of like sort of in, I wouldn't say I'm in the music industry, but I've talked to and become friends with a lot of my guests and there is something different. It's really easy to get on with you guys, man. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because I'm doing this show. I mean, I, I, I've probably had less than five assholes out of 905, that's a very low asshole ratio compared to like, I don't know, tax make, accountants. Make that six fucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, compared to like fucking tax accountants or lawyers, God forbid. Yeah. You know, I mean, you guys are pretty easy to get along with, you know, and I think you, and I think part of it is what you said. You know, it's kind of like all athletes have great hand eye coordination, all successful musicians are pretty easy to get along with because you you can't not be and do that for a living and be you, successful. You've got to get up with other people. You got to get unless you're um unless you're doing just solo work, which I do do, you know, and and you're just by yourself and then it's you making all the decisions and doing anything, which I love. I really really love as well. But it's it's a it's a different discipline. You've got to you've it you have got to compromise. You've got to know when to dig your heels in and when to back off. You, and you've got to be able to you know, communicate. You know, yeah. And, um, but even then, if you, even like if you're a solo artist and you have band members, you got to get along with them unless, you yeah. know, I guess oh, there's yeah. occasion, the occasional asshole who you hear about is like, you know, really difficult or something, but that's really few and far between. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And music, music will do that. It will bring, you know, I, I, um, I've said it before. Music, music is magic. I mean, what is magic if not making something appear that was was not there before? You know, a, a rabbit out of a hat. Yeah. And um, what music is magic in so many ways. And one thing it does do is it brings at a performance. It brings all these people together. You know, because of music, and especially when it's like the I I remember when I you know when I came up with the, as where I was when I came up with a song, and even the idea of coming up with so actually music is magic because I don't even think that I feel like the author of a piece of music. I mean, yeah, you're just a conduit, right? You, you are just a conduit because yeah. a tune will come out. I've heard that I, you know, so consistently. A tune will come out and it's like, well, I didn't think that into being. That didn't exist 30 seconds ago. 30 <sighs> seconds ago, sometimes I'll just play a chord and start singing a melody, change the, change the chords, 
arbitrarily, and then the melody will move to that, and then do, and now I've got a verse. Right. So, well, I didn't come up with that. I didn't have. I hadn't been working on it and trial and error and this. It just came out, you know. Right. And it's it's as a, much a surprise to me as it, to anyone else, you know. It's got, and you know, if it's got a charge. I mean, most of the time it may be rubbish, but you do something. It's like fuck. I've got I've got something here. That, right. You know, it's got a real charge to it. And that's magic. It just, it, you know, and you, you yes, that you, you could explain it. You explain why it isn't magic. And oh no, I think you'll find this this synapse bouncing off it. But why not call it magic? It's more fun, you know. Yeah. More, <laughs> and and it brings people together. And also, music changes people. You know. Oh I mean, yeah, man. Like magic, it's alchemy. You're not the same person after you've heard particular bits of music that you were before. Hmm. Remember, um. Oh God, I can't remember the title of it. There's a, a Julia Holter came out with an album uh, to have you in my wilderness a few years ago, and one song really, really landed for me. Um, oh God, I'm terrible with titles. Something about the shore, um, but the the chorus sort of goes, "The birds can sing this song," and this just got so under my skin. And like I said, I'm quite obsessive, but for about three weeks, I couldn't think of anything else. I wouldn't listen to any other music. I'd just have to listen to that or be thinking about that song. Come in, at the time I was doing a day job and come in from work and I have to just put it on. My daughter was saying, why are you always listening to this? I said, I just, I, I can't. There's, I don't know whether I'm trying to get to the bottom of the mystery of it, but I just, I wanted this song to inhabit me. But it makes you and feel now, good, man. Like, Until the day I die, that song will be, you know, if I ever, you know, if I hear it again, it's like, oh, there's my song. You know, it, it got under my skin so much. It became part of me, you know, and that's, that's magic, right? You know? Yeah. You know, my, uh, my oldest son, who's going to be 33 in a few months, he, uh, when he was born, I had made a, you know, I had a boom box and I bought a, I made a cassette tape. And when he was born, um, one of my favorite songs was playing. It was theme for an imaginary Western by Mountain, Leslie West, right? Okay. And forevermore, every time that song comes up on my, you know, it used to be the radio, but now it comes up on my iPhone, my list or something. You know, I have to stop. I text him or I just take a picture of it and, you know, text him the picture. And there's certain songs that have that impact on your life. And it's a wonderful feeling. It's 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 the best thing in the world, man. It just connects. It just lands, and then you've got it it's with you all the time, and it's accompanying you. It's like a you know, it's like a friend that, and it's a way it, of. It is a friend. It's a way of projecting. I've never thought about this before, actually, until just this second. But in a way, it's a way for the artist to sort of to connect to you because that song, Julia Holter would have put all that work in. You know, she's obviously not fucking around with this stuff. It's the real right. deal. She puts all that in, and I don't know, it probably landed for lots of people, but it certainly landed for me, and now we're connected. You know, now she, she'll never know. i probably never meet her. I hope I do, you know. And I'll say to her, oh, if you need an opening act, by the way, Julia. Oh, <laughs> right oh, on. Know, pretty easy. That's no right. Kit, no but, um, but, you know, I mean, it, I'm connected to her now through that tune. It really, really – I mean, the rest of the album's beautiful. In fact, the, the album afterwards, Aviary, I think what, is what's it? What's it? Her name is Julia Holt. Spoken Julia Holt, H-O-L-T-E-R. Is she British? Just, no, just American. She's American, okay. I don't know and, much and about her because I don't, I don't have that obsessive – I'm, now I just hear the music and get into the music. It used to be that I had to know where it was recorded, who produced it, who engineered it, where, where you know, I used to look at the sleeve notes. Now I don't, that's not my what, What's the name of the record? Uh, to Have You In My Wilderness. And it's called well, Dude, something. if I happen to get her on this show, oh. I will let you know. Tell her that. Yeah, she's amazing. Thank you. I'm gonna but but for example, for, but that one, for example, the song that really kind of went deep for me. And so, yeah, so that, so that, the thing, but, oh yeah, so why was this an amazing experience in China? So just the culturally, I never thought I'd, it was never on my, um, bucket list, China. I was really glad. I, I, I'd love to play everywhere, you know. Yeah. But, um, this was amazing. And the gig itself was really incredible because I'd say that maybe I can't put an exact percentage, but the majority of the audience was under 30, which is a very nice experience to, to play to, to young people, yeah. young, non-cynical people. And also I'd say at least 50% of the audience was women, which is also really nice to actually yeah, that's unusual. To, it's a different energy. Yeah. And so, yeah. and they were really up for it. And this venue was, um, 
I think it was about. I like what you said. You said non-cynical people under thirty. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I can come on to that, but you know, it played to about 500 people, which was amazing. And this, the, but there was a big multi cam thing going on. There was like a, um, not a dolly, a rail at the front of the stage with a digital camera, about five or six cameras, and they were, they were streaming this live. And, um, the, so I, you had, I was, you could have had like 30, 40 million people watching that. Well, not quite that many, but, you know, I'm we just did saying in a place that big. We did, we did this, we did this show and then the, I think she's called PG was the woman that was organizing the whole thing. I mean, there was this guy who did a radio show, but PG was doing all the legwork. She was amazing. Um, and when we came off stage, I was performing there and I was aware to some degree, not much about the cameras, but we came off stage and she went half a million people just watched that live. Holy shit. I'm glad she told us that afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know, that's a lot was, of stress, that was man. Really like, fuck. that's anxiety. Yeah, that's pretty wow. badass, man. Yeah, that was quite wild. I mean, we had, we had about an hour and a half of signing afterwards. It was it was like being in the Beatles or something, you know. That's pretty cool. I'm glad you got to do that. That's great, man. And what so would that, be number yeah, three? That was, that was amazing. I don't know what what is number three. Oh, okay. So, um, again with Gong, um. What happened was uh, during lockdown, you know, no more gigs, no more anything. I went actually, I had a bit of a breakdown. I went mental, you know. Um, I went mental. I love I when British mental. people say that <laughs> because it's such a, it's something that it would never be said here. And when a British person says that, just the word <laughs> mental, a bit mental, or I went mental. Yeah, I went, I went I mental. I can't explain it. <laughs> I did go mental, you know, um, and I'm still, um, I'm still piecing, trying to piece my life together, uh, post my poster lockdown thing. But what, one thing that happened, I, I, as lots of people, I became really worried and anxious and stressed and depressed that I would never get to do this again. Yeah. This and what had happened to me about two years before, in about two thousand, I th no, actually even maybe a year before. Maybe 2018, my wife, who does, you know, all my accounts and stuff, um, and I'd been working a kind of – I'd been working a, a day job and doing music, and I was self-employed, so I was able – it was a – you know, you got to – again, talking about decisions that you make in order to um, – the hustle be in the right place that you have to, you have to do a job where you're the, you're the boss. So as soon as a gig comes up, you can just drop work without having to ask anyone's permission. Yeah. Um, and they got to a point around 2018, my wife was doing the books. And at this point I started DJing as well. And I had an agent. Um, and my wife just said, you know what, honey, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to go up the ladder anymore. We used to call it. I was, I was a, I guess what you guys call a house painter, a painter and decorator. Mm -hmm. And it was getting, each year was getting more and more that music was creeping up in the earnings and decorating. We've, but there must have hit a kind of point uh, where she said, you don't have to go up the ladder anymore. You're, you're, you're earning enough mu money from music, which. It was yeah, that must have been like, a I'd, beautiful thing. That was like my whole life waiting for, you know, I've been working, I've been working certainly since I left school, my, or, but, you know, even at school, my whole life had been getting towards at least being sort of independent. So I could just do music all the time mm. and not have to, um, not have to go up the ladder. Um, so this, this was a quite recent development. Um, and then for that to be, that to be, um, Oh, and away. then for that to be removed. Yeah. And I got oh, really, really unhappy. And I yeah. thought, well, and I thought that this is never coming back. I mean, I thought of for a while, what if gigs never happen again? Yeah. I mean, it was like that. You didn't know where there was, there was no sort of guidebook or, or kind of map for, for where we were going. We were just in total, no one knew what the fuck was happening. Right. Yeah. Totally. Um, so I did like a couple of online concerts, which are like, they were cool. But I really, really didn't know well what's going to happen, and it, the, the audience with mask or the band with that. It, it, and then finally, 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 I mean, I did do a couple of shows, but they were the ones with like social distancing and all that sort of thing. I did a Utopia Strong show with social distancing, but it, it was nice to be out, but it still felt weird. And then kind of we weird, yeah. Time after that, I think. Um, and then finally, the first time that Gong got to, oh, and another thing I would say is that. Pretty much every night, 
or rather I should say every morning, because the thing about dreams, you say, oh, I had this dream last night, but you don't remember the night ones. You remember the morning, I had this dream this morning, just before I got up, because that's the one you remember. But pretty much every, um, every morning I would have the dream about being back with Gong and performing with Gong again. That was my constant dream. Um, and when we finally got back together, our first gig was at a, a festival in the UK called Cosfest, which we played a couple of times before. It's a real kind of, it's really cool. It's a very grassrootsy sort of hippie um, festival. Uh, it's not massive, you know, and this year they had to really limit the, um, limit the uh, amount of people that could come because it was just post COVID. And Gong was headlining. It was the first time that all, we'd, we'd had lots of Zooms together, but it was the first time that all five of us got back together again. Because we're, we're sort of an international band at this point. The, the bassist was spending a lot, I think, half his life in Norway. And uh, the other guitar player lives in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Okay. Um, so we, it, 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 and we were finally together. And I suppose over those two years or whatever it was of, of not playing, the importance of it, especially if you're trying to work on yourself and thinking about what it is, you know, we each of us do, the importance of Gong really, really started to go deep for me. And and just what we were doing and our role with Gong and, and just the whole reason for doing Gong, because we'd been, we'd been basically, there's no original members. We're this band playing all original music. So it's not like a, covers band or anything. It's not a yeah. We do well, we now we're just down to one, only one old piece in the set. Everything else is stuff that we've written. Um certainly um uh, by the time before COVID, we we're already about at this point two thirds to three quarters of the set, our stuff and a little bit old stuff. Because just I give you guys credit for that because that's unusual. And well, you, I mean, you, there was there was no choice again where there's where there's misery. There, there was no choice. We were never yeah. going to be a. I was never going to do that. I didn't want to. You know, it wasn't my. That wasn't my calling to be in a covers band. You know, right. I, I will play other people's music if I like it, and if it's their music, like Cardiacs. You know, although I I did end up kind of writing stuff towards the end, but I play in your friends' bands that I haven't written and stuff. But th that's cool. But with with the stuff that I'm is my big thing. I, it's got to be. You know, I wasn't going to be in a tribute band. Um, yeah, but most people don't look at it like that. Most people look at it like, "Hey, we're playing gong music." Yeah, well, that but that then that wasn't that wasn't why we were put together. That wasn't what David yeah. David Allen wanted. He wanted us sure. to continue. And if they wanted, there was people that could have probably done a tribute thing much better than we could, or or, the, or that I could. Mm -hmm. I could only bring my own way of writing songs to it. And luckily, sure. you know, that luckily that it it kind of it, it, it works. It fits. Yeah. But uh, so, but I'd been really, really thinking about the importance of Gong, and and as Gong as a vehicle of um, raising consciousness, Gong as a vehicle of positivity, of always going upwards, of 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 ritual, of there being of being an importance of to um to to make the or, or ceremony or something to make each concert like you know but that we are going to transform this whatever wherever we are we're going to transform this into a temple and we are all going to have a shared psychedelic experience or a shared um raising of consciousness through music because i do genuinely believe that that's what music does it's it's magic it has a supernatural quality i do genuinely believe it's like this is it's like a communion we're all together and something is going to happen where and you you know if if the audience are on your side, the gig is better. It, you, you can only yeah. make that connection if everybody's on board for this. And also, I think things that I would have maybe been a little um, not exactly cynical about or frivolous, but be because of the what it had done to me, not being a musician, it really made me double down at how important this was. And I think that then made me take it a lot more seriously. Not that... I didn't take it seriously, but I really thought, and this is when I started to think that, well, if not me, then who kind of thing. Look, we've got a job to do here. We've got a job to do here. There's something very important that we're doing, even if it's just, well, not even. For the people that have attended, we are existing in a kind of, in a space where we are all together for X amount of time, and we'll, I want us to all have this shared experience. And, you know, it's almost like a, 
I've I've been in this role that of, of I can't be like some self conscious guy looking at my feet. I've got to think of myself as a shaman, and if I think about myself as a shaman, well, then I am a shaman. I'm I am yeah. actually I'm here, I'm here now to sort of channel the you know the language of eter eternity. I'm here to channel it through music and deliver this message kind of thing through music. So what happened is that. To, on some degree, everyone in that band must have been thinking similar-ish similar -ish thoughts. Because when we got back together after these two years, fucking hell, the band totally fucking changed. I mean, we were good before, but just suddenly there was a new energy going on. It was like we got together for this gig, and then from that, the, playing that gig was like, oh, fuck, we're, th this is another, something that has happened now. This is Gong. This is what Gong is in 2021 or whatever it is. And from that point onwards, I've never, ever felt on the back foot about what it is that I'm doing in Gong because there was always a part of me that thought, yeah, but people in the audience are thinking, oh, he's just the guy that's replaced David Allen. He's this yeah. and that. Who does he think he is? All that kind of thing. And I, I, I was kind of, you know, I, you know, I wanted to be confident and the gigs were great, but I was sort of on the back foot. But I really came through that COVID with a new energy of like, no, no, we've got a job to do here. Gong, Gong is here for you know, Gong isn't a band. It's a, it's a mythology, and it's, it's always been about something, you know, positive, something and bigger than, and bigger than the band, psychedelic, and I hate to use the word <laughs> spiritual, <laughs> you know, it's, it's. It's a, it's about this thing, this thing moving upwards, about the light, about moving forward, it's propulsive. And I really, really got it with when we came back and we, we've, and all of us, you know, we all felt it. And I think everybody in there felt it that, that day as well. You know, we, we re and that was really something because there's, once we did that, there's no going back. But I think that's, I think you could only get that when having something taken away. It's like you people that get sick or severely ill that were sort of ho hum about life. And, and then they're like, you know what? I need to be more deliberate about my life and fucking live every day like it's my last because it could be and and they've experienced that you yeah, know every so day you had this blessing th right absolutely so you had this thing taken away from you and then you deliberately said this is a, this is a blessing I need to make sure I honor that and I'm of service to to the people that that are here and that's how I can do my job to you know when you have deliberate I had a guy on the show one time, um, Greco Barato is his name. He's a session musician out of, out of um, LA and he plays, uh, I think he's from Brazil, I believe, but he, he plays a lot of different stuff, but he made a comment to me and I said, well, how did you get that done? He goes, I just set my intention and I did it. And I think that's what you did. You set your intention. This isn't a gig. This is a fucking, you know, religious experience we're all going to have together. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, and that's you're it. in control of that, of that. There, that's why you had that different energy, and I, and I'm I'm really happy that you got to experience that, and it probably carried forward with you. Yeah, I think it was two years worth of those dreams and everything, and just thinking this would never happen, putting into it. But yeah, that, that's exactly it. And what you said, this is this this isn't just a gig. This is more than that, and just that feeling of well, all the people who are one looks up to. They're all people, you know, that they're, they're no better nor worse. They're just people that just did it. And so yeah. I think that, that there had been maybe before that point, maybe it was a confidence thing. It was just like, well, look, I can, I can do this. If not me, then who I've, I've, you know, and I, to, in order to, to do it, I have to be that person. I can't pretend to be that person. You know, uh, I've got to be that person. I've got to make, make myself into the person I need to be to front gong. Yeah. Um, you know, so. If that, if yeah, I mean, that, I think that's it. I had to, I had to make myself into the person I needed to be, in order to front Gong in the way that this version of Gong. Yeah, that's great, man. Thank you. That was a, that was. Thanks for sharing. That was a really cool experience. Cobbs, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with in life, and how'd you get through them? Um. Well, I, I, I can think of sort of three times where. Um, actually, one of them, one of them relates to the guitar. Um, three times where I've sort of got depressed and I've, i grew up with a lot of mental health things in my family as a lot of um uh just around my family has been a lot of mental health problems so i was sort of 
you know, I was aware of it. I always felt like it was sort of relatively um, unscathed. But I remember the first thing that happened, first time this happened, I moved to London when I was 21 uh, and I left the band I was doing with Dan. And me and my girlfriend moved to London. I was trying to do a new band. Um, it just wasn't happening. And I just had this real fear that um, I wasn't able to write songs anymore. And everything I was trying to write just oh, was wow. crap. And I'd always written songs since as long as I could remember. And I just, I, they just, I, it's just that like everything I wrote, I thought was shit. It's like, pff, nah, nah. And I, I had this real fear of like, God, if have I, is this my Sid Barrett thing? Is it, if, have I, is it, is it game over now? Was all the best stuff I did behind me in Plymouth? And At 21. My metal, my metal band. Yeah. Is that <laughs> it? Is it game over now? And I, and I, and it wasn't really until um and Dan Dan you know the rest Dan and all that moved up to London as well and we started our new band the Monsoon Bassoon and then I was back in the game again but um I I realised I, I sort of realised sort of got depressed and um you just I mean the hard thing is is I think that the um the uh, the the coin of like uh you know the of self -conf com of confidence. And of like complete sort of lack of confidence. Um, what's the word? Um, you, you know, you know, really, they're, they're the same thing. And you need, if you're not surrounded, as I'm not, by um, yes men telling you how brilliant you are all the time and giving you money, or certainly like you know, uh, you, you, some <laughs> sort of reward for what you're doing, then it's you really have to have this, you know, this confidence that almost verges on the. The arrogance, yeah, you know, it's like hubristic kind of. No, what I'm doing is really important, and uh, what I'm doing is is crucial. And you have to believe that because otherwise, why would you do it? It's, it's not really. How can you like, do I it? Mean, you got, you've got to do it. You got. To, it's almost like an arrogance. You have to have this mad self confidence, and of course, when that goes, you know, th things fall to bits. And the, the the second time this really happened was I was about I'd just become a parent um and i'd made an album i think it was 2014 i was doing a band called knife world mm -hmm. and i was making a record called um the unraveling and it was i really expanded the band we were like a, an eight-piece band at this point with three-piece horn section i was i was writing all the parts um and it was kind of i i'd really imagined really over thought through exactly the album I wanted to make. I knew how I wanted it to sound. I'd written all these kind of cogs of arrangements, and it was this quite sort of, you know, almost like trying to make the um, Eiffel Tower out of matchsticks kind of record. And I was going to, you know, record it and mix it myself. Um, and it was just a big undertaking. And what happened was... At some point, it got more and more on top of me, more and more on top of me, this record. And um, I started, and I got to that weird point that I just couldn't bear to hear the songs as I was mixing it. I was at the mixing stage. Oh, wow. And it was just. Is that why you called it the unraveling? No, that would, well, that, that did fit. That, that fit. Yeah. I called it, it, I called it, it was, I like to have multiple meanings. That was one of the ones, but I already had the word the unraveling because it was about. My, when my friend Tim Smith from Cardiacs had had his um, sort of stroke and heart attack thing, our whole like scene that we had our bunch of friends really unraveled mm. and all of our lives sort of really unraveled as well. It was it was definitely an album about that. Um, it was written in the aftermath of that. Um, and I got to the point where um, um, I, I, I'd, I'd been spending ages on this one track um, called Don't Land On Me trying to get a mix together and, 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 you know, mixing it alone. And the drummer, Ben, of and poor Ben, you know, he, was, he wasn't to know. The drummer, Ben, said, oh, I'm in, I'm in the area. I'm in, I'm in Hackney. Can I come over and listen to how you're getting on? I was like, oh, no, really? So I said, oh, come and listen to, you know, listen to Don't Land On Me. And I played him. And this was this extremely, you know, what I saw as this delicate, like, this song with all these bits that happened. I mean, it's a pretty complex tune. Uh, don't land on me. And I played it to him and he went, yeah, it's pretty good. And that killed me. That fucking killed me. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, not that he, <laughs> I've, I've never told him this actually, but it was like, 
I, I, you know, what he needed to say at that point, it was like, no fucking way, dude. This, like, you know, this is amazing. I you did this. He was like, <laughs> yeah. and it, it got it got to the point where um, it got to the point where I remember going into the my the shed, my studio, which we built in the garden, um, and like I opened the I opened the master folder with the unraveling on it, and inside it was eight separate folders with the eight tracks of the right. album. And I remember sort of just sitting there in the shed, looking at the screen, and um, I was just unable to bring my hand to get the mouse and uh, and click open these one of these tracks and work on it. I was just sort of staring at the screen, and meanwhile thinking, "My God, I've I fucked everything up." I've put you just my, sounded like you were really burnt out to me. Really, I, I fucked up my but then. I just thought, my who am I? The the big thing, which is really hard to deal with, is the demons you get, you go through. It's like, who am I kidding? Oh, uh, that little voice here. You mean that little yeah, voice here? Just going, <laughs> who am I fucking kidding? <laughs> I let my parents down. They're really disappointed in me. My wife gave up work. She had a really good job as a solicitor, but no, she gave up work because I was doing this thing, and we're still living in this tiny little rented, you know. Apartment. You just apartment. like beat yourself up over every facet of life. After everything you, can, you know. Yeah. I've done this to follow, to pursue what to pursue this, and who's really interested in it? And it's bullshit, you know. And once that wow. confidence goes, and in fact, it took it took David Allen. It, as, it, as it turned out, I got a friend of mine, Bob Drake, who's amazing um, engineer, to to mix it and it ended up being cool. But it, it took David Allen asking me to join Gong, which was happening at the same sort of time. It took that for me to get some confidence back, um, wow. which which is great. Um, but I remember seeing a um, a meme, and it was a um, it was a Venn diagram. This this got me thinking. I was seeing a meme it was a Venn diagram, and it's got like one circle that says complete narcissism, you know, total narcissism, and uh, another one that says total like, self-loathing or something self-loathing and then where they are where they meet it just says art and it was like <laughs> yeah, interesting man. yeah that, so man, that that, that was... pulled you out of it no i mean i saw that later i thought well oh, okay. yeah i can you know yeah totally all right but, that's um, funny so that was that was really really bad but the worst thing was that hating your own hating my own stuff and and having that feeling of who am i kidding yeah, but when well, you're then, feeling then, insecure, man, that's and, and when and when you're burnt out and tired, that that's so normal. I think. Yeah, my life my life has been a waste of time. Who am I kidding? Yeah. I've let everyone down. And right. And then the, the last time this happened was beginning of lockdown. Um, I started working on a started working on a um a second solo album. I just finished Hip to the Jag, sold that in the April of lockdown, and actually the. That was great, you know, d doing that. Um, and I started working on the follow up, and then at some point, six months into, I was going good guns on it because hey, it's locked down. I can work on the album. And uh, at some point into those six months, the same thing happened. I just couldn't get into the tracks, and I was starting to think, "Who am I kidding?" But this time, I was like, "I know what this is. I know what this is. This, this is depression. Fuck it. I'm not going to kill myself." Close the album, put it away. I'll come back to that. And, th and go for a I walk did. or something like that. Overall, what I did, what I did, I got really into this because um, things were getting really like toxic at home, and it was only a little flat, and all three of us were going mental because we're all, you know, me and my wife were locked down. Yeah, the relationship was sort of falling to bits, and so I'd just spend all day in my studio, um, and I discovered this. Uh, two things happened. I discovered this. Um, YouTube channel called uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe, which I still and this I still maintain this ritual to this day. I discovered this car channel called Cartoonist Kayfabe with these two amazing cartoonists from Pittsburgh, Jim Rugg and Ed Piscor. They're both writer artists, you know. And what they do on this channel, they there's no music. It's just these two really enthusiastic guys talking comics, talking comic books, and sometimes I'll interview other creators but mainly it's just them analyzing or going through these classic comics um uh going through them page by page the camera over the top talking about them going oh man look at the pen work talking about how each panel was made talking about the comic everything and i at the same time this i was turned on a friend of mine turned me on to um a, a jazz guitar player called jimmy bruno 
a New York jazz, jazzer called Jimmy Bruno. I think that's his name. And he said, you've got to get on board with Jimmy Bruno in the, the seven or whatever, it's five boxes. And Jimmy Bruno basically showed these exercises where there's um, f- uh, you're playing all the white notes up and down the neck. And uh, I've never been one, I've never, ever been one to practice scales. You know, I'd always start doing stuff and then I'd kind of um, start writing a song or something. But because I just had nothing in the tank there, I'd, I'd, I'd just watch these, and there was about two years worth of this cartoonist kayfabe to catch up on. So I'd spend about six hours just watching this cartoonist kayfabe and just playing these these positions up and down the neck really slowly, really slowly. And whatever part of your brain is processing these groovy, well, these nuts talking about comics is the, is a very different part of the brain that's going, you know, doing up, down, yeah. up, down, up, down on these different positions. And what was happening was that each night I went to bed feeling, well, I made myself a better guitar player today. I got to be better at the guitar today. And so I felt like my day wasn't a waste of time. Um, and also I found out loads of things about my guitar playing because I'd, I'd always been, I'd had all these sloppy, well, I, I still do have a few, I had these sloppy habits that I've had since I was a, a kid because I'm self-taught. Sure. All, all these sloppy habit habits, which I've never, have, have remained uncorrected. And there were bits that I'd always be faking or fluffing or, whatever but i and i i never realized how much the left hand wasn't talking to the right hand but by doing these just doing exercises nothing creative i didn't want to do anything creative i just wanted to do just wanted to do um play these exercises or else i just i'd work out an iron maiden solo i'd work out an adrian smith solo that I could never play before and go, right, I'm just going to watch this. I'm just going to play, play that. So, cause it feels so nice on my fingers, play that solo over and over and over again, just to get under my skin and do this stuff that I'd never been able to do before. Um, and it, and it, it, and of course, you know, I got out of it and once Gong started playing again and, and, and lockdown was over, I, I was in a much better state of mind, but I tell yeah. you what, I came back to Gong. I came out of lockdown, a much better guitar player, than going into it. And I remember when I picked up the thing when I was a kid, because I used to just play it all the time, you, you'd you always go through it as a learner, quite early on, you go through these like plateaus where you'd play yeah. for a while. And then every now and then you'd, you'd feel like, God, I'm doing something that I couldn't have done a week ago. But they get less, as you get older, they get less and less and less. And I, I was never really one for practicing before this. But now I practice all the time, and I still do. luckily this, this cartoon channel, Cartoon Escape, they still upload content every day. And even if it's twenty minutes long, I, I did one this afternoon. You know, before I talk to you, even if it's twenty minutes long, I'm just I'm watching that thing and doing and doing my scales. And you're doing your scales. You're doing yeah. your practice while you're watching. Yeah, the or doing scales. whatever it is I need to do. Working on a yeah. solo that I'm trying to trying to just get the picking right for and. And now my other, and I've got a new, now before gigs, um, I warm up for at least an hour before I go on stage. I never used to do that. Um, so, and of course. So you started taking your guitar playing much more seriously. Yeah, 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 yeah. much more seriously. And there's things that I used to, duh, it took me getting to be like being my fucking 50s to realize this, whatever, my late 40s. It's like, do you know what? If, you, if you've been sat in that dressing room for an hour, an hour and a half doing this, and so that when you're on stage, you're already an hour and a half in. Guess what? You're not going to fuck up that solo that happens yeah. five minutes into the set. You know, you're not. Gonna, you're really nimble already. Duh. Yeah. And beforehand, I mean, a lot of the time, apart from the sound check, the first time I would touch the instrument in the day would be um would be like when I walked on stage and I'd be really frustrated wow. at my playing. It was really obvious stuff, right? You know, but um, no, but it's it, yeah, but it sometimes, uh, you know, I. I don't, I'm happy. I don't say I like getting older. I don't, I don't like that my check engine light goes on a little more than I want it to. <laughs> yes. But, um, I really like getting old because I'm, I'm, I feel like, okay, now I'm finally getting it. There's stuff like that in different areas of my life. Like, okay. And that feels good because I'm always like to progress and, you know, it's, ha- I, you know, it's nice to, to feel like you're making progress in different areas of your life. And I think getting older sort of, if you work on things and you think about things, I mean, if you're not thinking about anything, you're fucked. But you know, if you, 
you have more awareness and you can combine, you can put shit together easier with less stress in your life. And I, so I, I understand that because I, I think that's the, I think that's the beauty of getting old. Yeah. And, and the other thing about taking what you do more seriously, which and I say, I always took it completely seriously, but things like, especially touring in the UK, um, you know, each time a, I play a, a city or a town, you got friends in that town who want to, you know, see you. So what I would do is I, I, I used to go and meet up with them for, like, for dinner or for a drink or a couple of drinks before the show. Mm. Now, the thing is, I'm, I'm nervous about the show anyway, so I'm not really like hanging out in any kind of proper way. I'm always just sat there thinking to, and they, they, then, you know, not, I'm no good at making small talk anyway. And then so you're the, not the other, present like when you're yeah, there. Yeah, not really present. Yeah. And, and the other thing is I'd have a couple of, I'd, I'd never, ever, never play drunk, but I'd right. always have like a couple of pints before a gig because, hey, it takes the edge off. Sure. But what I realized is that that was making me more nervous. The meeting them, this process was actually making me far more nervous about the show and being out in the open and out around people. And and now what I do is I'll I'll do the sound check. And as soon as soundcheck finishes, I'll eat something really small. I put a really huge window between me between eating and performing now, which I realize is much better for the voice. Just learning this stuff. So I'll finish soundcheck, I don't know, say 4.30, I don't know, 5.30. I'll eat something really small, like a salad, and then I'll go out for a walk for about an hour and a half. Um, on oh, my good. Own. And I've got a terrible sense of direction. So what I do is wherever I, unless it's raining, wherever is that a I'm British like, oh, thing? Because my wife is like, she's like, oh, right, oh yeah, I think your wife's British, right? Yeah. She's she, every time she says make a left, I always say, babe, you know I love you, and then I make a right <laughs> because yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm it's just, like a hundred percent of the stuff. time incorrect. And she's a realtor. I'm like, how do you get to your houses? She goes, I, I always get there. I just have my map. I'm like, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. No, I'm, I've got I would never. Direction, so yeah. I just walk in a straight line, <laughs> and it, sometimes, and I and I like to be by myself because some people say, "Oh, you know what? We should go for this walk because there's some great sites." It's like I don't want to see the sites. For me, it's just shapes walking part. Go, what it is? It's for me just to walk and just be able to get get my thinking going. And Dude, walking is really, amazing, like that. It's yeah. really really important for me i do it every day I walk so about, fucking awesome maybe when i'm at home i walk about five miles a day same walk every oh day oh my god that's awesome no no i mean i really really i walk wow. up last and tour and back uh two hours and, and it really wow. sorts me out um and certainly before i'm about to do it like before i do an interview or anything I, I walk and i come up with all my best ideas when i'm walking so but before a show i'll use i try and walk at least an hour maybe an hour and a half just but in a complete straight line so right. sometimes it'll just take me right out to industrial areas of the city <laughs> it doesn't matter and then you know 45 you turn minutes around and walk way, back 45 minutes back and i sneak into the venue and then i just sit in the dressing room and just shred you know just go to a little the, yeah the whole time until the moment the, half an hour before we walk on stage Sometimes I, I for one tour I would say, okay, I'm going to allow myself one tin of beer. Now I don't even do that. Half an hour before I go on stage, then I'll put my stage clothes on, and I'm good to go. But I'm this is my new routine, and I don't awesome. get nervous. If I don't see fan, fans or friends, then I don't feel nervous. And it's like, look, I'll hang out after the show if there's time or whatever. But I, I'm I'm at work, you know. I want yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I want to do the absolute best thing I can possibly do, and um, I want to and, give and the best best show I can. And this is the way to do it. And if it makes you feel any better, I have guys coming to town and we always, you know, we, we try to connect guys who've been on the show. And, uh, I, if they can't hang out, it's everybody under, I, and everybody understands. So, I mean, nobody's going to be, if you're concerned about that, people understand. And if they don't, that's their fucking problem to be honest. Yeah, I know. You. Cause you're working, I man. I mean, this isn't like, you know, you're in high school, like, Oh, we got a gig. You know, this is like, you're fucking living, you know, yeah. and you're, you're, you're you. This is you. You can't like go up there and yeah. So everybody's cool with that, I think. And I, you know, I I would I couldn't enjoy that two hours before the show being so outside of outside of the venue or anything. I just have to, you know. Now I realise what I really need to be doing is just playing my instrument, you know. Mm. And it took me so long to realise that because. I I just thought that that was a necessary a part of the show was that you meet your friends and you get really really nervous and sketchy and and I thought that was a, that, that was just part of what the the day involved and now I now I realize it doesn't and I love it I love 
I absolutely love just being there and warming up and playing and knowing that I'm going to write, I'd be trying to be the, the very best I possibly can as a, as a performer, as a, a, as a player, as everything, you know. You know, that's one of the things that I've enjoyed the best about aging. I realized that, that there was a certain component of stress in my life that I was creating and bringing into it. And yeah. I really focused for a long period of time to, to look at those things and not eliminate them completely. Things like that, like what you're talking about. And, and for me, I never, I, I never thought about that. But once I started, I was like, yeah, man, my life is much m infinitely more tranquil and, and not, now I've become allergic to anything that's, let's say allergic, but now I don't, I avoid, you know, the first decision part of my, you know, we all have like decision brackets, like, you know, when we're, should we do this or not? My first thing is, is, is this unnecessarily stressful? That's the first question I ask myself because I found that like I like not being stressed. Yeah. You know, we, we condition ourselves, especially if you grew up in a, in a, a, a house with some trauma, that's your norm to a yeah. very great extent. And so everything you do, if it's like that, it's like, hey, man, that's that's how we roll. But It's almost that. like you seek it, right? You, yeah. you, you're drawn towards that kind of thing. Because that's your norm. At least that's the way it was for me. It was like that. Yeah, I grew same. up in a very stressful house, incredibly. Yeah. So same, I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm the guy who's in the foxhole. You want to be in the foxhole with? And I'm like, and I got to a certain point in time, my early 50s, I'm like, yeah, but I don't have to be in the fucking foxhole 24 hours a day, do I? I don't have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so liberating and it's like, you know, and now I'm like the calm one in the house and everybody's like, you know, what happened to dad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's like, you know, Zen, Zen dad. Yeah. Well, great. It's great. I don't need that stress. I don't need that bullshit, you know? So I, I that's good, man. And, and I know. And, what, and how old were you when that, when that, when that coin dropped? Embarrassingly, I was probably in my early fifties, like. Um, I'm 59 now, so maybe like 53, 54. Yeah. And it happened inadvertently. I met a buddy of mine, a guy I met on this show, who was one of my closest friends now. And I was just talking to him and I said, man, you know, things just don't seem to be working out right. And he said to me, he goes, you should check out the yellow book from ACA. So ACA, it's like AA or NA stuff. ACA is Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunctional Families. And I said, okay. I didn't even give it a second thought. I was just like, I, I was, I mean, great. I'll check it out. What, what's my dad? I didn't even ask him what it is. And I started going through this book. And, it, and when you come from a fucked up family, I was like, oh, my God. So, and I've been to counseling. I've been reading self-help stuff. I'm 59 since I'm 20. Um, but something about this opened doors and, and made things so clear to me as, and it made, and look, for me, I was always trying to work out that set, that struggle and stress from my childhood, but something about this book spoke to me in a way that I was able to understand that, Hmm, I can do things and I, you know, it just made me understand this with so much more clarity. And I don't have, I don't do stress anymore, man. I mean, if something happens to me from the external, that's life. You got to deal with it, right? But I stopped contributing to my own stress once I did mm -hmm. that. And, and I, my life, I've been infinitely so much happier ever since to the point where on at Thanksgiving, Anne always, uh, she passes out this book to everybody who's there, you know, kids, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. Now my daughter, husband. Um, and you have to write what you're most thankful for. And I always look at mine last. I, I always feel like, and I read her thing. This is five or six years ago. And she's like, I'm so glad Craig worked that program. That's what she was thankful for. So I said, I'm, I said, I'm much less of an asshole. Right. She goes, Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, it was, it's just really benefited. And I'm not like preaching on the book. If someone wants to get it, get it. That, I mean, it worked the for yellow me. Yellow book. It's, ACA. A, it's called ACA Yellow Workbook on Amazon. Yellow it's tw okay. 20 bucks here. Let me tell you, Kavis. And I was not a guy who ever had any kind of faith or believed in a higher power. The book opened the door 
the book and a couple of conversations I had with guests of mine opened the door for me to have. I'm, I'm not a religious person at all, but I do feel like uh, um, I surrendered a lot of my, well, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make this happen. And I surrendered a lot of that to, I'm not going to be on the results committee. I'm going to do the footwork for whatever it is I'm doing. And if it happens or not, it's up to this higher power. And taking that weight off my shoulders was like, I, I've never let go of something so great in my life. Because when I, again, when I was younger, I was paying my own bills when I was 14 years old. That's a lot oh, of yeah, fucking yeah. pressure, you know? Yeah. And so I was always, man, I got to hustle. I got to do this. I got to do this. And then I'm like, I'm not, you know, so you, you, you know, you build up these self preservation behaviors, but when you leave that environment, nobody comes to you and says, again, this was my journey. And I'm not, you know, saying everybody's is like, nobody comes to you and says, Hey man, you don't have to be so closed off. The rest of the world isn't trying to fuck you up. So you go, in, so you go into the rest of the world with these same, like, you know, these same self-protection mechanisms that do not fucking serve you once you leave that environment. Yeah. It's, um, what what William Blake called like the mind forge manacles. You realize you you create these, you create these sort of like problems for yourself. You know you almost cripple yourself uh, 100%. with these with these ideas, and you can and then you then you start to think that you are those ideas and that you can't change. You know and that 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 that's just you you know the the you know that that's who you are. No, but I can't help it because I'm this. It's like, it's like anything's like smoking. I quit tobacco. Like, 13 right. years ago and it's like you'd see people yeah but i can't because doodle, doodle. It's like, you just gotta quit you know um right but yeah yeah it's those things and, and but i think it's right there in front of you all the time yeah some of these hang-ups you've had that it, it the solution is just there in front of you but and even though you sort of know it you don't know it until uh until it happens sort of thing you, you got to ask the right questions to the right person that's what i've found you got to find the yeah. right person and then you got to ask them the right questions cuz his answers all over the place especially nowadays there's no no nothing is unanswerable now i mean god you yeah. could fucking sit on your computer and get the answer to 90% of the problems in the world you know and uh so i i i get a lot of what you're talking about and uh yeah yeah so sorry, I didn't mean to talk about myself. No, no, I mean, that's really interesting, man. You know, oh, um, it's changed my life. I mean, all my kids are like, I notice uh, dad doesn't really get excited anymore. <laughs> and Anne's like, no, he doesn't. <laughs> so, because I just have a different mindset about what actually is bothering me and what's not, and, and what's my business and not. Like, if my kids are all adults, whatever they do is not my business at this point. Yeah. I mean, they're not doing anything dangerous. Of course, I'm concerned about the same thing we talked about before, health health and safety. But absent of that, it, it, you know, I'm not, I'm done. <laughs> you know, you need help. I'm always here and you know that. Yeah, but I'm yeah. not, I don't have to worry about minutia there. I've just got to like yeah, relax yeah. and, you know, enjoy my days, man. You know, the golden years. <laughs> uh Hey, what's the funniest thing that's happened to you on stage or in the I can't, studio? I, I can't answer that one, actually. That was the one I haven't got an answer for. No worries, I can't man. think of anything funny, really, that happened on... Um... Oh, well, I, I just thought of one now, more, but more yeah, as man. a DJ, as a DJ. Um, so uh, I can't know whether this is the case or not, but um, me and... Your man there, Steve Davis. Uh, we uh, we're sort of uh, best friends, kind of thing. And you know, we started a, a little while ago. Um, we used to, because it's a bit long, a roundabout thing. But we started DJing in a brewery. I mean, I, I used to DJ back in Plymouth a bit, and sometimes at gigs in London. But we started actually DJing together at a brewery in London. Um, Two thousand and I don't know when it was. 15 something like that um now we got to know about steve davis he's because of the snooker he's a extremely well-known british sort of um personality because of his snooker and he's still on the television even though you know he won six uh world titles in the 80s holy but, shit 
you know, and you know, he was the first person. He was like the best snooker player in the eighties. He was a big inspiration to the next generation. And um, but even now, he's on the BBC all the time as a pundit and presenting the snooker. So that part of his life, you know, he's extremely well known. He's not like some cult celebrity. But his the music thing with him. It's not really, you know, th there's not much crossover. Yeah, and of course. Certainly yeah. in London, <laughs> certainly in London, which is full of groovers, you know, what happened is beyond any sort of vague novelty, you know, that there's really, really, you know, the the uh, the Venn diagram is very, very small <laughs> of snooker fans and people that like that like experimental uh, yeah, avant-garde music, you know. <laughs> but we we were doing a radio show together. I like it. He's like like I was dying. really small. You know, a wee overlap. <laughs> uh, it was, so you know we were we were doing a radio show together and then um on a, on a, on a local community station playing weird ass music both really two hours every week on a monday night and both and both really turning on we had a lot of similarities particularly the band magma was our, our starting point but then um but then you know really turning each other onto lots of different stuff um and i realized very, very early on that he, he he really liked cerebral music and thought about music in the same way that I do. And I could I could tell that he's very, very musical. And that's another thing going on to doing our band, the Utopia Strong, but he certainly heard mu music like a musician. And um which is a funny thing to say, but uh mu mu I think some musicians anyway hear music in a certain way. I think you you hear the mechanics of it, or I don't know what it was, but he certainly heard music like a musician. Um, and then we were at Magma show, and a guy said, "Look, I'm working at a brewery. Um, do you guys want to come and like every month come and play some records?" We we're like, "Yeah, great." So we did that. It gave us loads of free beer. We're both beer enthusiasts, particularly like craft beer, um, strong craft IPA sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. we were doing this for a while, and then these two guys. Um, these two guys came along for, that were running a, an electronic music festival um, in the UK called Block, B-L-O-C. And they came along to one of these nights at um, the Red Church Brewery and said, hey, guys, do you want to come and play at our festival? Oh, my God. That's so cool. At this point, because we weren't playing, we weren't necessarily playing electronic music or, or even dance music, really. We were playing like stuff that was kind of bangers, but pretty much by some, you know, obscure French 70s jazz bands or German, you know, cosmiche groups or what, whatever, you know, a real, a real eclectic mix. And we did play some electronic, but not that. And it, not, not mainly. And, um, you know, this festival, um, it, it was amazing. I mean, um, Holly Herndon was playing, of whom we're both a really big fan. And uh, Tom York was doing a solo oh, set wow. there. Man, um, that guy is so freaking talented. That's amazing. Yeah. So oh, yeah. talented. I mean, I don't, I read a lot of stuff. I don't know. People have a lot of comments to say about him. I don't, I don't know why, but I mean, I know he's talented as hell. Oh, he's brilliant. But it was, it was mainly electronic stuff, but we did this set. And in this set, we were playing things like Super Nought by Black Sabbath, playing like Peaches on Regalia by Zappa. Oh, deep uh, cuts. Just loads of bangers. But it went down really, really well. And loads of stuff that we we're really into, like obscure shit like Magma and Vaidorge and. <sighs> I can't remember what else we were playing. Loads of like mad stuff. Um, you know, a Japanese band called Typographico, just this four hour set. And it went down really well. And I think it was like a bit of a breath of fresh air, maybe in that festival. I don't know. But then after this, we, you know, shortly after this, we did a few other things and we got this agent. We got a booking agent who was amazing and he, he really got what it was we were doing. And so then we'd start getting booked for a lot of festivals. Now, the thing is, we're not we're not the kind of DJs that can turn up to a festival and hear, you know, take the temperature and hear what the kids are into and play that. We, we, we do build a setup and we, again, we put everything into the set that we play. We're not frivolous. We really, really think about what it, what will go well. And we, we bring a big bunch of CDs with us, but it is the stuff that we like. We don't necessarily play stuff that you, you know. Um, and it is, you know, a lot of the songs, a lot of the pieces will be in 5.8 or 13.8. And I'm very, you know, I'm very uh, sort of physical. I'll show the kids where the one is. I'll show them how to dance. Around their dancing kids, here's the one. The, <laughs> well, you know, it, it is our kind of stuff. And uh, we find funny, that the man. heads, the real heads, the uh, get, get it. And at the right festival, at the right time, we, um, you know, we go down really well. Uh, but at the wrong festival... It just doesn't land. And um, 
we got booked for this uh, festival called Camp uh, about two years ago, I think it was. We'd been booked for this festival called Camp Festival. Now it's a very, very family-ish festival, and um, we got this rule of the thumb where, and I don't know why this works, but you know, in the UK, a lot of people wear like glitter at festivals. Now festivals aren't what they were in the eighties. In the eighties, it was really only music fans that came to festivals, hmm. and there was a bit of a lifestyle thing. Now. Everybody goes to festivals. People take their kids. It's cool, you know, that's good. But this one camp festival is very, very family-ish. I mean, what, you know, and if you can't smell weed, there's the two things. If you go to a festival, I don't smell weed, and I, there's a lot of glitter. It's like, we're going to we're gonna bomb. We are going to fucking bomb. You know, uh, you can oh, just tell it. Yeah. And no weed, lots of, lots of, uh, lots, lots of, of glitter. Uh, Food, food of the world, different stalls selling food, lots of kids running around, lots of glitter and fairy wings. And it's like, <laughs> we're going to bomb. And we were playing after Fat Boy Slim was, oh the, my. was the headliner. So it's yeah, like, that's yeah. That's a yeah, really he, bad position. Whatever he is, but, you know, nothing against Fat Boy, but it's, we knew it wasn't our, necessarily our people. Um, yeah. And we were the only, we were the only uh, stage open we were the only stage and we were on at 11. So the main stage finished at 11. And we were this big marquee and there was about, you know, there's going to be like 2,000 people capacity. And everybody was going to leave Fatboy Slim and come up the hill and come and see us. Um, and before us was like one of the, you know, a, a much younger DJ playing like dance music and the kids were going fucking wild for it. And me and Steve were just looking at each other going, <laughs> not really you know, sure. We knew, we knew, it's like going into battle, you know, knowing that, that, that with, you know, with we no knew, bullets. You know. Anyway, we said, well, let's you know, we'll, we'll, we well, let's go easy on them. So we, we we started with some track, and people were sort of into it, and then we could tell, all right, we haven't got them. Let's put on a surefire hit. And there's, I don't know if you know the um, this was this is like a pop song for us. There's a there was a, there right still is a band called Battles, be a, you know, Battles with Ian Williams on guitar and. Um, Greg Saunier on, uh, sorry, uh, not Greg Saunier. He's from Deerhoof. Um, uh, John Stanier from Helmet on drums. Um, and it's this really groovy track called Atlas. But it's got that real glitter beat. It's really catchy. It's really fucking banging. And it's like, this is our get out of jail free card. And we put on, we dropped Atlas and already more people were leaving. And oh I'd say within, a, within the space of, I mean, we always say that when we, when we DJ, we find, we, we sort out the heads from the haircuts. You know, we find our people. It turned out within 20 minutes, we 20 fucking minutes, we found out that our people was about, 15 people on the whole festival. Oh we just God. emptied that. And we had nothing. We hadn't, no matter what we really, no matter what we had, it was like, all right, we won't go hard on them. We won't put on typographic oh. right now. You know, we, we're, um, We'll, we'll we'll go you know, we'll put on talking heads once in a lifetime there you go come on talking heads you know yeah how do you not like that day, fucking talk talk you know uh, life's what you make it nothing 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 and it just it but we but I tell you what those fifteen people at the front boy did they have a good time they got to hear this mad music through a huge PA but yeah we emptied the place just completely wow. emptied it but I didn't feel bad the fever's good and it's like look. <laughs> You should That's have done you, your research. I don't yeah, know. right, I right. must have thought, oh, Steve, they, and this word has got around, uh, you know, and people don't do their research on the, you know, you've seen it on social media. Word got around, Steve Davis is a techno DJ now. He's never been a fucking techno DJ. Yeah. You know, we've never played that. Oh, no, Steve Davis, no, he's got a massive drum and bass collection. He's a techno DJ. I don't know what it was. They... Because of him had been having this name, they thought, oh, this will be a laugh. Steve Davis, techno DJ. It's going, no, 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 that's that's not what... <laughs> that's, that's not, not what, what I'm doing, doing yeah. You know? So I didn't feel bad. You know, they, they should have done their research before we booked. So there's plenty of us doing sets on YouTube and stuff. So right, right. That was, that, yeah. mean, that, was, that was kind of funny, but, you know. Um. Wow. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's, but we were playing sucks. righteous you know this is righteous music i've you know this is music that i've you know it's really righteous so i didn't feel like bad about it i didn't feel like oh maybe i'm not playing well enough and he's like no we're, we are playing righteous tunes we're keeping the bpm level up you're just fucking not into it man you're just yeah, into, you know you're not you're not music fans you're not weirdos right. 
It's like Anybody hiring Rage what? Against the Machine and to a jazz audience, and they're like, "Oh, we don't. This is horrible." Yeah, yeah but mean, what do you expect? That stuff's good, right? You know. But, no, but I mean, it, it's not the right audience. Yeah, yeah, it's not the right audience. That's their fault, man. So, yeah, that was a <laughs> sorry. Go on, sorry. I realized that we're quite early in the question. <laughs> Tell me, uh, it's all good, man. What uh, What are the most important lessons you learned from getting older? Um, uh, I don't, God, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still learning. Right. I mean, just, just, I mean, just the, the things I said earlier about, you know, the ways where there's choice, there's misery is a good one. Try to stick to that. Um, and just to, just to sort of just stick to it, just do your thing, keep doing it. And, uh, eventually that people catch up and even if they don't catch up, I mean, I'm, you know, n most people have not heard of what I do and most people, if they did, they wouldn't like it. So, um, I'm f finding my people. And as long as I'm, you know, doing my thing, um, you know, that's good. I mean, in terms of being a person, I'm, I think I'm getting better at, um, I'm getting better at sharing. I used to be really quite the, um, quite the sort of my way or the highway. Um, and I realized once you realize that actually you're not right about everything, I think that's one thing about getting real older is re you're, you're so sure that you're right about everything in your twenties. Um, which is good, which is really, and, and, and you need to be, the yeah. world is changed by people in their twenties, you know, revolutions are started by people in their twenties. You, you're so sure that you're, you're right about your, about things and, you know, there's this righteous indignation and you're full of piss and vinegar and whatever, but now I I'm, I've got a good idea, but sometimes I I I I don't, and I find that I'm wrong. I'll I'll be proved wrong time and time again. And so hum I think whatever is hu humility. Yeah, I think I've learned that. It's funny. That's another thing I got out of that book. What's so important about being right? And I was like, yeah, that's that. That's, and I, I had a lot less uh, arguments with people after I kind of like digested that. Humility. I'm going to yeah. tell that to myself as well to remind like to remind me. Uh, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Well, it's comics. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've re completely reconnected with drawing again. Um, I was big, really, really big on uh, art and drawing um, when I was a teenager and going into my um, early twenties. But certainly when I was a teenager, um, and it was like comics looking shit. I was really, really into comics. And back in the eighties, I all did used to design all the graphics for my band, all the t-shirts, all the posters, all d done by hand. And of course, computers come along and then you think, Oh, well, this can do what I'm doing better. But it, it wasn't until I well, became a parent and started drawing again with my daughter, but also, um, did that first album, my solo album, Hip to the Jag and thought, yeah. I've got no answer to no one. I'll start to draw. And that was my, that, that album cover really was my getting back into drawing again. And now I've, ju I've just finished the cover of my next solo album and I'm, I'm really coming along with it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw all the time when I'm not, when I'm not playing, making, doing music, I'm, I'm drawing now and just trying to, you know, I just want to get, I just want to get better and better. Uh, everything you know i want to be a better singer i want to be a better producer i want to be a better guitar player i want a better songwriter and i think it's you do do this for yourself i mean i think it's but also you do it you 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 don't want to you want to feel that everything you do is an improvement and drawing is the is my big one mainly pen and ink pencils and then pen and ink i, I want to get better at drawing um i walk a lot i i like socializing but um now that I live by, I'm here by myself. Well, I live, I lodge with my friend Mike, but I, I, re, I never realized how much I enjoy solitude and enjoy my own company. And, and I, I always thought that I, I wouldn't, but I do. I love it. I really, really love my own company and love. I, I've got a good, you know, good routine. I get up, you know, the same sort of time I start work. I work on music and then in the evenings I do drawings and I've sort of, that's, I mean, my, the work is the hobby. I mean, yeah. I really enjoyed writing that book. You know, I'd, I'd never written a book before, um, but I realized it's it's the same as writing a song or making a record or doing a drawing. And so I'm going to go slightly off the path here. But one thing I realized was that um, usually in writing, when writing a song or 
mixing particularly, making an album, doing a drawing. And I realized the same thing with writing the book. About two thirds or three quarters of the way through, I hit a wall and I'd lose all confidence in the thing. And that's where you can sort of like give up on it. And you and it's learning and it's a skill, I think. It's a skill to learn, to work through, to know that, yep, I've lost all confidence in this. I'm not feeling juiced up about it the way I did. Because, you know, when you come up with an idea, it's really, really exciting and you just want to, ah, this new tune. But you hit a thing and it's, I, lo- I always lose faith in the thing. I got that same thing with the book. And it's just like, you just have to work through it. You have to keep working through it, whether you like it or not. And then the, the feeling of working on something that you're not feeling, you know, that it's not nice, but you've got to work through it. And then you'll get to the other, you'll, you'll get over the line. You'll, you'll love it again. And it was definitely like that with, with the book. So hobbies wise, I just, I like making stuff. I like yeah. coming up with stuff and making stuff. That's really the, the hobby. I never really stop, you know, I don't, but no, in terms of, do I go like, play football or go fishing or, you know, I, I don't do anything like that. No, it's just not my, I just don't really feel it. I, I, I do. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do want to talk about guitars a minute. Cause you got a bunch behind you. Yeah. What is your yeah, yeah, number yeah. one? What's your go-to guitar and what other two round out your top three? Cause okay, I saw so you playing. Go-to. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go here's ahead. Here's the go-to. I love it, man. Here Jack. is the go-to. This is a Squire. J. Maskis, Jazz Master. Um, and the finish was – it's a, it's a really interesting – well, really, it's a, an interesting story behind it. This guitar belongs to a friend of mine called um, Nick Marsh, and he uh, sang and played the guitar in a band called Flesh for Lulu. And this was his spare guitar. He had a, a Jaguar as his main guitar, and um, this was his spare. And it's originally, it was sort of like cream colored with a gold pit guard. Um, and he died, um, he died a few years ago. Oh my God, sorry. Uh, you know, and he, his partner, who's one of my best friends, in fact, I knew him because of his partner, Catherine, who's, uh, you know, one of my go to people. She's, again, extraordinary composer, the best singer ever, um, an amazing engineer amazing producer, great mixing. You know, she's just brilliant. So she was like, and that's how I met Nick through, through her. But, um, I always sort of wanted one of his guitars after he died. And she said, well, you know, uh, you know, so, so I got this one. Wow. The J Masters. Um, Jazz Masters. But when I got it, it was pretty beaten up. Uh, the electrics didn't work. It had a few gouges in it. And I thought, well, I can't, I don't want to keep it as a museum piece. And I did a bit of, um, I'd never had like an offset guitar before. I did a bit of digging on it and I found out that the things to do, apparently there's a big sort of like, uh, trend in, um, uh, sort of modding jazz masters and offset guitars. So I got this new bridge. It's an American company called Mastery. It's incredible. This bridge, as soon as I put the bridge on, it changed the sound completely. It's so easy to play. I got a new trem. I never used trems much before, but now I use it all the time. It stays completely in tune. And then I got my, my wife did the finish on it. So it's really, yeah, that's so yeah, cool, it's man. One off and it's, it's decoupage. It's lots and lots of bits of torn up paper, a pot, layer upon layer of that and covered over with PVC. Wow. Really lightly sanded. We took the neck off and we took the pick guard off and I took all the hardware off, sanded it, gave it to her because she'd already done, she'd already done like tables and stuff at home and chairs and covered them. And they looked amazing, really psychedelic. So I picked some paper and she did this and then she finished it in yacht varnish. So it gave it this kind of yellow, rather than lacquer, it's yacht varnish. It's so cool. This was what, yeah, I love it. But honestly, it's so easy to play and i've really reconnected with the sort of lead guitarist part of me because i for years i didn't really play lead guitar and um it's it's brought out my inner hendrix really and so this is totally my go-to guitar in terms of for gong um it became that and on my solo stuff i, I use this as well but and, and recording it's just it's it's so easy to play i've never had a guitar with single coils before so it takes a bit of getting used to because they, they, they hum a lot, but it sounds so it sounds so great, you know. That's and, awesome. Um, See, yeah, I would have th- thought you played a jazz master all the time because your no, music it's... to me is like a- appropriate for that guy. What were you playing before that? Before that, so I got this. Uh, this became my main guitar in two thousand and nineteen. Mm-hmm. 
before that um, it's nice that it was your buddies too man i know i know i really wanted something of nick's you know so yeah. really sort of knowing that it was his this was my one I, and i always wanted always wanted this guitar oh i love it and it's it is going to come out of retirement the gretch this is the white falcon the gretch ah falcon. there you go in honor of uh brian oh, setzer man yeah and I, I i covered up the scratch paint with a bit of uh wrapping paper there because it's just a Looks more psychedelic. It does. And um, I, of course, I, I, I put it into retirement. This was my guitar for when I was in all the time I was in Cardiacs and Knife World. And when I was doing Guapo, this this was just my, this was the guitar, the go to. Wow. Um, what happened? I always wanted one, um, but I thought they were just out. You know, you'd hear that they were going for like 50 grand or whatever. And then I remember, I can't remember what happened, but had Gretsch got taken. This is, you know, I'm sure in the comments or whatever, I'm going to be littered with factual in, uh, inaccuracies. But I think Gretsch got maybe taken over by Fender or yeah. something. But they, they yeah. started making these in Japan. Um, I remember seeing a, uh, an interview with Brian Setter, and he's talking about all his Gretches, and he's saying, "Man, the new Gretches are better than the old ones. You know, these are they, they stay in tune, they play better, it's much nicer. I only use like the new ones. I'd heard they were made all handmade and." japan and stuff and then a, a friend of mine bought a gretch and it was like because you wouldn't see that many around like in because they were you know the rare guitars or whatever a friend of mine got this new one he's like man this they're great they've, they've got one in in town there was a there was a place in town underneath virgin megastore called i can't remember what it's called but he said oh they got they've got a white falcon there and my wife at the time because i've never had any never had any money but my wife was like, and I, and I just joined Cardiacs, and my wife was like, "Fuck it, just just get get it on the credit card," you know. And I thought, man, I'm in Cardiacs now. I de I deserve a proper guitar. I'd never had a, a name guitar. I was playing a Westone before this, which, by the way, is great. Okay. Uh, sort of Westone Semi, uh, Westone Rainbow. So um, I'd heard there was this one in town, and I went in, and I was so excited about how can I get this Gretsch? My wife, you know, Dawn had said I can get this on the credit card. It's going to be brilliant. And it's the one with like the Billy Duffy one. Have you seen? I don't know if you know, but someone got that sort of funny shaped, like a different shape whammy. Actually, what okay. I really wanted was like the Neil Young one, the double cutaway, but they, yeah. they didn't have that. But um, I so I went into town and I played this one, and it, it just wasn't my guitar. And I was so heartbroken, but I wasn't feeling it. It's like if you've gone on a date with someone who I don't know, not that yeah. I ever have. I've never done internet dating, but say someone that seems really hot, and then you. You go on a take, you, you're just not connecting. And I, yeah, I there's no, it's like, yeah. It wasn't there, and it looked great, but it's like, this isn't my guitar, you know. And, and you've got to have that with a guitar, man. You yeah, have yeah, to, yeah, yeah. And I felt really disappointed. And then Jim from Cardiacs, the bass player, said, oh, you know, they, they got one down in uh, Anderton's, down in Guildford, which is just maybe 30, 30, 20 miles outside of London. They've got one down there. So um, me and my wife went down there. I saw it and it, it had that whammy on it. And I said, you know, I took it into the room. And as soon as, as soon as it was on my lap, it's like, man, this is my, this is my guitar. You know, wow. I don't know what I'm supposed to be playing, but I knew it was my guitar. And so bought it there and then and just couldn't believe. I remember when I was like a kid getting this like cheap honer, like explorer shaped. I love, I love that shape. I've got a, I've actually got a destroyer now, but I got this explorer shape because Iron Maiden, you know, and I remember coming home, from, I was about 13. It was really, really cheap. But I remember I'd come in and I'd see this funny shaped uh, red honer in my bedroom and just think, I can't believe that's my guitar. And I'd get up to go to school and see the guitar there and think, I can't believe that I get to play one of these. And that's how that's I so cool. you know, felt with the Gretsch. I'd come in and just see it in my room. I'm like, no way, I can't believe this is my guitar. So that was I played that one for, for years and years. Um, but then... And in Gong as well, but I think when I got the when I moved over to the Jazzmaster, I'm quite monogamous with guitars. You know, it's like I have one <laughs> and I just want to, you know. So I've, I've, I still record with the Gretsch, but actually I'm um, I'm playing guitar for. I talked earlier about my friend Catherine, who's yeah. You know, she she, she uh, her big thing is a, th a band called uh, Medieval Babes. She does um, played in the US quite a lot actually. And I, I was playing with them for a while, but her she was in this kind of gothy band in the uh 90s called miranda sex garden 
and they've recently reformed and Again, the, the guitar players. Those are both fan. cool names of bands. Cool name, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're yeah, great. Fun. I used to go and see them play a lot. It's a real fan. But Catherine's a pal, um, and actually, the guitar player was a friend of mine, Ben, and he he passed away a few years ago from cancer. And the, oh and the band got back together. Oh, sorry, it's, it's our age, man. You know, um, the band got back together, and they, you know, they they said, "Look, oh. do you want to give it a go?" And I could, I could fit it in, and it's like, well, yeah, I, I love, I love these tunes. I love Catherine. I love. It's really fun to play. It's lots of effects pedals and lots of noises and stuff, and it's really powerful. And the guitar isn't necessarily the focus, but it's good. You know, I get to, I get to sort of because of the way Ben played. He wasn't necessarily a technical player. He was more about textures and attitude. That I thought, well, I can really, I can inject my. Yeah, but that's a whole skill set, man, that is like very legitimate, you know, being a master of your effects. That's not, I mean, that's not my thing. I don't, I wouldn't know the first thing to do with that. It's, it's not, well, I, it's a I skill. I have a very specific setup, but I've got used to how, how to use them because I do that a lot in the Utopia Strong and it isn't totally effects pedal based, but it's lots of, it's, it's a bit, but you do a lot of ethereal healthy. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do a this, lot of I mean, this is a stuff. bit more rocky, this stuff, but it does involve, you know, but just the approach anyway, I think he improvised a lot. So I can I can inject my stink into it while still remaining my true. Stink. To he said that song. twice. That's funny. Yeah, I've yeah, exactly. Well, that's what, what you know, you put your stink into something, you know. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, you you want it you want it, I think, you know, because I've got a specific stink. It wouldn't it, it's like garlic in a in a meal, you know. You don't always want it, but if it's in there, you know it's there. And that's really with me when I play guitar in a band that isn't my songs. I want you to at least know that it's me playing and not just anyone that could have done it as a session because yeah, yeah. I always get them, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my stink onto it. And okay, so, so you got the Jazz Master and the Gretsch. Is there a number three? Well, there's another thing I'm going to talk about because it's, a, it's my latest one. I'm like, I really don't need more guitars. I mean, I've got here one, two, three, four electrics, and I've got one – back in london uh and that's all i need i don't need more guitars but if i did i'd like an electric 12 string maybe or uh but we did it we did a gong show in um a place called the electric ballroom in london last year and um we were playing with a a, a band called osric tentacles I and mean, it was like oh yeah i've heard them yeah you know, these guys it was a joint headline tour so it, we, we would do different – half of the tour, we were the headliner, half the tour, they were. But we did the same length set. It's like the idea was two headline shows, but someone's mm -hmm. got to go on first. Now, I always – I like going on first, you know. I'd much rather go on first because there's less time between sound check and the performance. Okay. And also, you know, so See. I like that. And then also, if you go on first – it means I can come off stage and get wasted and hang out with my pals. <laughs> after a gig, you know, well, because, you know, Touché. good gig, reason. Like, yeah, of course, you know, because yeah. after a gig, you've got to pack your shit up and then everyone's getting chucked out, especially the way venues are in the UK at the, the level that we're playing at. They don't, they don't keep this place open till midnight so you can catch up with it. You know, everybody gets, it. so now yeah. as yeah. soon as we finish playing, get my guitar off stage, change it, get my stage gear off, open a beer and I go out and, see you know meet meet up with yeah, my pals or whatever that's you know. cool uh which i love so yeah give me the give me the first on any day of the week <laughs> um uh, and in london we were playing on we're playing first and i came i came off um stage and this guy sort of got hold of me and he said hey i'm a guitar maker in israel um and um shabbat I've seen, guitars I've seen, you, I've seen you uh no they're called coils coils okay. boutique uh, he's a guitar maker and make pickups in uh, Israel. A guy called Alon Sage, A L O N E uh, S A G E Sage, Coils Boutique. He, and he said, "I've made a guitar, um, and I think it took me three months to make it. I think it's the best guitar I've ever made. I want you to have it." And I was like, "Really? He just gave it to you? Seriously? Not bullshitting? Let's let's swap addresses. I want you to have this guitar." Wow. Like, hey. And and um. And then the guy that was doing um, sound for the Osrics, Oded, had said, um, oh, I know, I know him. He's really highly regarded in Israel sort of thing. And I was like, I don't, I don't need a new guitar. But And then I was thinking, that was strange. And we came off tour. We opened the thing. And he said, dude, I'm sending it to you. Plus, um, you know, I'm sending you some pickups for the Jazz Master that I've made as well. Um, and then... Mm -hmm. 
And wow. he took the address. And then I got this message from whatever DPS, whoever the courier company were, saying, you've got to pay um, import tax, £1,100. <laughs> and, like, and you're thinking, oh. You know I don't need it. I didn't need a new guitar. So right. I got back in touch with them and said, I'm so sorry, uh, Alon. You know, I, I, I can't pay this. I just don't have that kind of money, you know. I can't pay this. And he well, said, you kind of feel at that point too, like something a little underhanded almost, you know, well, this, that's the import tax. And he said, dude, oh, that, so that, that's I, normal, saw, I, sorted, I sorted all this out. You, you, you won't have to pay a penny. I, the guy paid it. The guy paid it. And two days later it turned up. It's in a really, really posh case. And, um, Holy shows up. And God, that's a one-off human being. Total. One oh man, it's got. I I love it. I absolutely love it. So, so now I've made this because I've made this my Utopia Strong guitar now because I wanted to uh, have a guitar for a band. It's um the all the fittings are incredible. I've never even seen uh, machine heads like this. They're kind of locking these locking machine heads here. I'll wow. show you. There's his logo coils. I'm really looking forward to getting the opportunity to show this off because. I did this interview in Guitarist magazine, and I hadn't got this yet. And I really wish that I had. Ah, oh, you wanted to hook him up, yeah. For him, I've never seen a trim like this before. It's made out of swamp ash, hand carved. What kind of pickups uh, are in there? Pickups that he's made. I mean, I, I guess they're humbuckers. Are they humbuckers uh, or like, yeah? I think so. Under here, um, it sounds. It it doesn't weigh nearly as much. It's I suppose it's the closest things like a Les Paul. I always wanted a Les Paul. Mm. It's got that kind of Les Paul sound to it. It plays beautifully. It really, really plays beautifully. It's a strange shape. In a way, the bottom reminds me a bit of an Ibanez Iceman mm -hmm. or something. And then yeah, the a little, is, kind of, a little bit. Yeah, slight, slightly, slightly. Yeah, the, the it's like a, a, a like a Les Paul and a line. Telecaster made it yeah, or something like exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah, it's really thin, um, but it's kind of. Um, it, it's all look at that it's all it's all through it's beautifully made it plays beautifully um and wow what a kind it, human uh, being i know honestly and i i felt so kind of you know you really don't have to do this and i, I felt so um undeserving and well and just what a lucky what a lucky guy yeah who gives a I mean, who I gives you so a custom guitar and he said, and he said, I've been, I've been waiting to find the right person to give this to. And after I saw you play tonight, I want you to have it. So wow, I've, you know, I th this is my Utopia Strong guitar, but I use it for recording. I played it on the new Gong record because I do want that. Sometimes when you want that beefy kind of like sound, which you can't really get with a jazz master. I mean, yeah, the Gretsch does it, but so that's yeah, so I, cool, I, man. It's so, and it's called the Nihilus, which I've heard was the god of the Nile. So yeah, That's... Coil. I'm going to give this guy a total shout out. Coil's boutique. He makes amazing pickups, and he made this, which is just extraordinary. So cool. It's Good luck, really man. That's so nice. Strap locks on it. I mean, the whole thing is really first you know, class. Got corners on it. That's awesome, man. Well, enjoy that, man. That's a nice gift to get. Thank enjoy you. That. So those are my three main uh, three main axes now. Hey, uh, last question, Calvis, and. Before we go, I just want to say thank you so much. I really enjoyed oh, hanging out you. with you, I, I and it's <laughs> this is uh, awesome. And hopefully, we will get to connect in person sometime. I feel like where, so where where do you live now? Tampa. Tampa. Okay. Chances are better of me being in England than you being in Tampa. Okay. Is that, is <laughs> that in it, Florida? Yeah, it's in it's on the west coast of Florida. I so, was in like, Florida. I played a cruise. You know, they have those mad cruises that go. Yeah, cruises that go like the Prague Florida. cruise or something. Yeah, yeah, Prague. Uh, Close to the edge, cruise to the edge. We'll cruise to the way. edge, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that I think leaves out of Miami. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right? That's right, so that's yeah. on the other coast. It's in South Florida, on the other coast. I'm like across on the other. I'm on the West Coast, a little further up. So, okay. but I'll probably be in England before you'll be here because I'm going to go well, with Anne at some point in time. Fingers crossed about, fingers crossed about America with Gong. We're really, dude, we're, we're really on it. We're really trying, dude. It's that would be awesome. Visas. You know, we're trying to do it. It's the cost of visas That's and flights nuts. and stuff. But I think we're next year, hopefully, fingers crossed. It was going to happen October this year. Fingers crossed for next year. And I haven't toured the U.S. Um, apart from stopping off in Florida, I haven't actually been over and toured the U.S. since 2012. So so, you, so you've been to the States. Work. You've been here yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. 
I love okay. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love it. That's cool. Well, if you need some input on like cities or something, you could always, you know, just call me or whatever. Well, no text too. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to point you and stay away from here. Go here. Um, last question. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and has that change been intentional or just a part of aging? Uh, I think that maybe what, what came um, – I mean, being a parent just, t- as you know, completely changes you, um, changes the way you think about your um, past because all these memories you have of the last uh, – certainly of your childhood – the minute, the minute you become a parent, you 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 then see it from the other, you know, the other camera that you the camera that you you didn't see before, and all these bits where I thought, oh, and the, then this happened and that happened, and you go, oh no, I was the asshole then, wasn't I? <laughs> I was the asshole. I wasn't, you know, and so that's that that's kind of that was a a big change. I think you know, tr- trying to be more humility, humility, and um. But I think focus as well. I think I've got more. I've got. I wish. I've. I've just got better at doing what it is I do, and I think it's down to confidence. I think you. You. You feel very self conscious when you're. You're younger. Um, that you're going to be judged or, or something. But I've kind of. I've got to that point now. Where I sort of don't give a fuck. You know. I, I think when you're younger, you want to. You don't want to fit in, but you're. I don't know. Yeah, you're concerned about what other people think about you. Yeah. 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 Which I'm not now. You know? Yeah. That's the number one answer for that question of, of is that what everyone you know, says no not everyone but uh, you know that's that's a number one answer as far as the most an- the most common answer people have said some version of i really just give less fucks i don't have to prove myself anymore you know things like that which is liberating it feels great yeah it, re- it really feels great you don't realize yeah. how much how much energy um it takes up just worrying about what other people think yeah you know? Yeah. And while I would never do, I would never want to deliberately piss anyone off. Um, I certainly don't do anything because I think that that's what I feel like I should be doing or something. Yeah. 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 I get you, man. Well, dude, let me uh, talk about what you got going on. Cause I want to turn as many people onto you as possible. Talk about, okay. So your last record was hip to the Jag. Great record. Thank uh, you. you got a new album coming out. It's like really soon with, uh, oh, Richard Wildman. Which is why it's coming I'm, out. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about right it. Called Heaven Sun. Heaven Sun. Yeah. That was that was a, a lockdown album. Richard is someone uh, I've been a fan of his for a long time. He's a composer um, living in Swindon. He makes this very lovely, sort of chamberish kind of uh, with for small ensemble kind of music. He releases his records under a name Carter Estra, and then started doing stuff under his own name. And um, I've, I've got a small re- record label called Believers Roast. I started putting his putting his records out on the label. Oh, you have um, a record label? But, yeah, it's just a small. It's a small. It's basically for my friends and me, really. Good for you, man. Label. It's not that. I mean, you know. But that, so um, we uh, um, during lockdown sort of said, "Well, should we should we collaborate on something like you know back and forth?" I think he did most of the heavy lifting. I was going through such a sort of dark place um, that. Um, oh, are you still there? He's, can you hear me? Look like you disappeared. Ah, you look like you're coming back. You disappeared for a second. Yeah, I know. Something It said I had that's to right. refresh the page. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. So I was going through such a sort of dark lockdown that, um, and I can really hear it in the record. You know, we, we were fighting, but he did a lot of the heavy lifting. But toward, towards the end, it started to really turn into something else. Um and uh, by the end of it, the, the the end result was like something that neither of us could have really envisaged at all. And again, talking about stinks, you can really hear both of our stinks in this, but it's, it's not like any other record we've made. And it, and it wasn't planned to be this, but uh, one of the last passes of back and forthing it, I realized I could turn it into this two, con- two long pieces rather than I think it was going to be six or seven separate tracks, but I kind of chopped some stuff up, moved it around and changed some bits. And then, added some more layers and it turned into like these two 20 odd minute pieces. Um, And then uh, I had a very turbulent year before this. And so it just, we were just sitting on it and it, it, and finally it was like, look, let's get it out. So it's only coming out at the moment on CD. Normally I'd release vinyl as well, but 
the wait, the wait times on vinyl are so great at the moment that yeah. I'm just really keen to get this one out because it, I've really felt like for both of us, we wanted to be able to move on from this record we'd made. So that's coming out on, and I'm, I'm really, we're both really pleased with it. It's really a magical record. And where can uh, people find it? They can order it from our Bandcamp page, which is just Carvis Tarabi and Richard Wildman um, on CD. And it will be Great. available on all streaming platforms from this Friday, so the, all the usual places. And and it's called Heaven Sun. What does Richard Heaven's, play? Um, what's that? Sorry. What what instruments does he play? Well, on this he plays all sorts, really. Um, uh, I think he plays guitar and a bit, bit of percussion and bass, and then it's, he's got a couple of friends playing horns as well. On that. Um, I play, I play bass, percussion, harmonium. Holy um, shit. I've got over there, I've got a koto, just whatever I had lying around, Santor, which is like an Iranian dulcimer. I just play a bit of everything. Cool. I'm not really, you said at the beginning of the thing, I was a multi instrumentalist. I'm not really. I can, I can play guitar and I'd say I can play bass guitar as well, which is a different thing. But other things, I just, I'm a player rather than a multi instrumentalist. So give me an instrument and I'll get something out of it. And right. I think. I'll come up with an arrangement that doesn't show my deficiencies as a player. So I think I have, I've got a room full of interesting instruments and I'll play, I'll, I'll come up with a nice arrangement that won't push my abilities too much. Sure. So when mixed in with everything else, it sounds really pretty. And it's like, Oh, he plays this, 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 and that. But I'm not really a multi-instrumentalist. The part I'm playing is very, very simple, but he just weaves in with something else that make, might make it sound you know, interesting. If you know what I mean, you know, I, you mentioned arranging, and I'm glad you did because I meant to tell you that I one of the things I was really respected about as I went through pretty much your whole catalog, and oh, uh, so is that or, is that you're arranging because you have a lot of things going on there, and it's not easy to make that controllable. And I, I was really, you know, it's not easy to do that. So I was really impressed with how you you know managed everything and everything fits together. That's tough. Yeah. I like That's it tough. all. I like it to be lots of cogs. That's how I hear, you know, how I hear it. Lots of cogs, and that one represents that. And also, I like it as a. I see a song or a piece of music as a almost like a set of balances. You you have to make it balance. If something happens of a a weight over here, then something over there must happen of a similar weight. And yeah, there's a lot of know, work. I, 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 I assign values to everything, and, and, it, and it all has to be – it can be the most fantastical thing, but you, be, you have to be able to put it down and stand up by itself. So, yeah. That's so a lot that's of how work, I, think though, of I love arranging because once you've got the song, the arranging is the really fun part. That's like, okay, I know these chords work, and I know that melody works. Now what can we, what can we do to make it the arrangement really fun? And, and the way I did Hip to the Jag was I wanted it all to work just – with a guitar and vo or harmonium and voice. And once I knew that worked, then, and a lot of the times I'd even take away the original guitar, but I knew it stood up by that. Then you can just add stuff and take stuff away. And, you know, so that I, so I love cool. arranging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could tell because you're good at it. Okay. So let me, you're welcome. So everybody, I'd love you to check out the new record, Heaven's Son. It's on Cavus's Bandcamp. Cavus spells his name K-A-V-U-S Tarabi, T-O-R-A-B-I. Well, actually, it's on the it's on his own Bandcamp, which is Cavus Tarabi and Richard Wildman. Okay. But I have my own Bandcamp with um stuff. Um, I've finished. It's not good to not good to talk about stuff that hasn't happened yet. But I have finished the the follow up to Hip to the Jag. Awesome. But I'm staggering staggering the release of that because we've got a finished a new Gong album as well, which is coming out in uh, fingers crossed. It's being mastered by James Plotkin right now. What's your time in America? Three ten. Okay, so I'm five it. hours behind you. He's mastering it now. That's uh, awesome. James man. Plotkin is mastering the new Gong album right now, which is coming out in October ahead of our tour that we're doing. Um yeah, man, hopefully we're so, Talk about um, the tour. What, the UK tour that is. Um, again, and that's in. Tentacles. There's a, what's that? And where? That's in November. That's Gong? in. Starts on November the seventeenth. Yeah. Awesome. First awesome. half of that. Um, so hope. Fingers crossed, we get it out in time for that. That's the idea. It's been. Dra it's not dragging on, but we've been struggling then, to get it over the line. That's finished. We've finally signed it off. That signed the mixes off this morning. <laughs> that's that's awesome, time. man. Yeah. Congrats. So, That's good. So it was very exciting. So we can't, yeah. so because of that, then I can't then put the solo albums. That's going to wait, even though it's finished, until maybe early next year. 
Very and cool. then I've got a few other bits and pieces which I kind of can't talk about yes yet because they're sort of secret. But I've got uh, a few other things that are going to emerge. Um, That's awesome, man. Very cool and stuff. you got summer gigs. You're doing a, a solo gig at Glastonbury, you said? Yeah, and Steve Hillage Band. We're doing some show at Glastonbury. And awesome. got a bunch of Utopia Strong stuff coming up at festival. It's festival season in the UK. Yeah. So um, it's great festivals because on the one hand, you – win people over and you get to play to people who would never have heard your stuff. On the other hand, you will, sometimes it's a tough, you've got to win people over. It doesn't always land, you know, um, but what can you do? It's like, you know, you, you go out and do the best you possibly can and it, it, yeah. it will connect with some people, you know, and you're not responsible for that, you know, yeah, yeah for the exactly. uh, results. So, uh, I would also, uh, follow, follow Cavus on his socials on Instagram. It's Cavus Tarabi on Twitter. It's knife world. One word, which is the name yeah. of his other band. And on Facebook, it's Cavus Tar Tarabi. That's right. yeah. Um, and he posts all his gigs on there as well. And check out his catalog. It's just a notice board. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, everything I'm doing, if you want to keep up with me, just keep refreshing my page. Cause sometimes I'll, I'll do a gig and people say, Oh, and you just heard about this yesterday. So I look just, I don't know how the algorithm works, but just keep ch checking my page. I whatever I'm doing, I post about it, you know, so. Awesome. And if you're on Instagram, you tend to see everything on there anyway. Yeah. Um, man, any final words of wisdom? Uh, wisdom. I'm just gonna... <laughs> Did I already do the David Lee? I gave you the David Lee. Yeah, yeah, that was great. No, got, that was no, great. Yeah. You're out of wisdom. <laughs> All right, man. Hang on a second. We'll wrap up. Thank you again for everything. It's really a fun time. I'm so glad we Craig, were Craig, I that, loved man. it. Thank you. Likewise. Hang on one second. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it on your socials. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Kavis Tarabi for hanging out with us. Uh, again, please check him out. The new record, Heaven's Son with Richard Wileman, W-I-L-E-M-A-N. Check out his solo record. It's a very, very nice record. It's called Hip to the thank Jag. You. And again, it's Kavis, K-A-V-U-S-T-O-R-A-B-I. Follow him on Instagram, on Facebook. Check out his bands, Gong, Knife World, and the Utopia, I'm sorry, I'm spacing the out. Utopia Strong, yeah. Yeah, Utopia Strong as well. And uh, follow <laughs> him on social media. If you're in the UK, check him out at Glastonbury or any place else he's playing. And uh, most important, man, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, have fun, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. I am out.